Hello everybody, James here. Storytime with Dutch Mantel episode 90. And Dutch, did, did you want to say something about what's going on here? It looks like I'm in Burgle. Where in the hell are you? You're, you are you look like you're in some back alley somewhere. What is... And you have one picture and one guitar. What is this? It's not like your normal background when you have a bookshelves and books and you look educated and you look refined. Now you look damn near homeless. What's going on? Oh, do you know what was even worse, right? So like, I've moved house, but uh, this is a couple of the things. We forgot to take the guitar. I've left all the computer stuff here because the internet is getting cut off here on Friday and then isn't getting set up until next Wednesday in my new house. So that Owen Hart book picture there behind me, Yes. That's the only one that remained here. I didn't clear this room out. Someone just forgot that one picture, so it sort of suits. And then no one took the guitar. And uh, But what they did do was take all my hair products, and what they did do was take all the shampoo, and this is the only shower that we've got working here uh, because the one in the new house still doesn't work yet. When you oh. gonna be to- when you gonna be totally moved in by next week? Well, I I'm already moved in. I've spent two nights at the new house, but uh, next next Thursday when we record this, I'll hopefully be in the new office, resplendent, oh. replete with many new pictures and such. Oh, I see. So you're moving up in the world? Yeah, like like the Jeffersons. So I'm told. Wait a minute. Have you said anything about my books yet? Oh, yes. Dutch Mantel has two books, The World According to Dutch and Tales from a Dirt Road. If you want them unsigned, you can go to Amazon. If you want them signed, you can go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. Make your request there. There are also diplomas that you can get from Dirty Dutch Mantel himself. He signs it twice. Dirty Dutch Mantel is the president and the provost is Zeb Coulter. You can order them from Dutch Mantel at Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. And it comes in a binder. Oh, yeah. There that's what you get. It looks pretty good, huh? Yeah. Get it on the wall. We've Even I've had emails, so the question emails saying, man, I'm thinking of getting one, man, I really like it. And they're selling like hotcakes, so you tell me. No, they are They are doing well. They, they really are. And I am still behind on catching up on the orders when I was in the hospital. Because when I first got out, I, I don't want to beat this to death, but, you know, people were saying, all right, what's the update? What's the update? I am still working on it. And I didn't know, <clears throat> I should have known or should have realized that Christmas was coming. So the the volume is going to pick up. But I am still answering Christmas messages because I had like a, hand, not a handful, but a, a truckload full of, of email messages and I'm getting them out as fast as I can. See, when I first got out of the hospital, I was still, I was weaker than hell. I didn't think I was going to make it after I got out. And then I could work like an hour or two. And then I just get, I, I would just get so tired. I just couldn't go on, but now I'm getting it caught up. So if you are behind in getting any kind of your merchandise from me, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you there. But the, the alternative is if you want a refund, if you're just tired of waiting and you want a refund, which I hope nobody wants, uh, I'll, I'll do that too. So you, you're not going to, you're not going to lose any money. You may lose some patience, but I'm doing the best I can. And I appreciate every, every order that I get. So, but the, but the uh, diplomas are still doing well. And because the, getting getting a diploma from the University of Dutch is quite an achievement, I might add. Do you have one? You said you'd sent me one. How long ago? Oh, it was only a week <laughs> ago, so you know, I, I'll give it a couple of months. Don't worry. No, well, it was actually six months ago. I remember, <laughs> or a year ago. I said, "Hey, I got you one," and I, I, I look at it every now and then. It says James Romero. I, it says that, but you don't have it. Because you never sent me your address. I did send I you my think. address. I sent you my new address a week ago. You did? Oh, yeah. You did? Well, I got to wait to the new one now. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, so I've sent that... you my new one. Okay. I'll send you my you new have? one again. I'm you not going to give it on, your I'm new not, one? I'm not going to give it on the air, though. It's Why, you 24. Think you're going to have some people... <laughs> You think some people are going to come to your house and boycott you or 
I mean, uh, kind of demonstrate in front of your house because uh, some of your views. I, be- I barely want my friends knowing where I hey, am. Yeah, I've I'm an isolationist. Over, what can I say? I've looked over the uh, the uh, layout for the show. Good show. I think let's just start talking about stuff and let's get into it. Yeah, uh, very, very quickly, I'd like to say uh, we are having to skip away a couple of episodes of Shane Douglas's podcast because one, he was in Canada for a week on tour and no one knew where he was. And then two, I couldn't make it for recording this weekend because I'm still moving house and I don't have internet over the weekend. So bear with us, everybody. We'll get back to it soon, I'm sure. I also have the Owen Hart book beside me. I'm trying to Uh, like that. I've got one on The Rock as well on Amazon. Links are in the description of this video and every video and every podcast. But as you rightly say, Dutch, let's get to it. We've got plenty of news to go to. And this first one, I haven't been put in the script because it's sort of like late breaking and I forgot to put it in. Ric Flair got physical on AW Dynamite last night and he even posted it on his own Twitter page. 20 second video. Tell us what you saw. Well, Flair's out there dressed like he's going to dump the garbage. (laughs) And I'm thinking, you know, Flair, even though he's not a full-time, a full-time guy in AEW, don't you think he should dress up like he used to be just a little bit? He went out there wearing a pair of damn work pants and just a, just a, like a green or blue t-shirt or something. And he's getting in there, and he he looks horrible. I hate to say that, but he does. And then he does – are we going to show this? No, it's AEW. We, we won't. Uh, okay. Go on to Ric Flair's Twitter, by the way. He posted, well, uh, as of today, as we record this, he posted it on Thursday morning. So Okay, okay. But it is awful. They, it looks like the Young Bucks – I mean, they beat up, what's his name, the guy? Uh, Darby Allen. They beat up Darby Allen, and then I guess Flair was helping him or something. Then they got Flair, and uh, they held him for Flair to hit him with a baseball bat. Then he turned. My God, he turns on the the young bucks. But he looks, he doesn't look, he's 75 or 74. He doesn't look 75 or 75. He looks like 95. I mean, and he's moving so slow, and I'm thinking, you know, oh, it's got to be hard for those guys. And this is not just a, a, a recent thing. I mean, this we've had old guys, older guys in the business forever, but you, you'd have to wait on them. And, you know, people people can tell that you, you're waiting on Flair. And it's, it's just awful. It's probably one of the – just the worst – one of the worst things I've seen. I mean, I've seen it before, but – Lately, you know, AEW is trying to trying to improve their product. It doesn't it doesn't improve the product. It did end up okay when all of a sudden they beat up Flair and walk up the ramp like they expect uh, Sting to come, and Sting repels down from the ceiling and surprises the Young Bucks. That is, it is. I kind of like the repel because people remember that. I don't know. You, I mean, listen, I'm just reporting on it. I like this word, arbiter. I'm not the arbiter of whether it's good or bad. That's left up to the fans. <clears throat> but I don't think how they could like that. I think they should have had him repel down while he was. they were beating up. I don't know. I would have done it totally different. But it's, you know, things work better when you don't expect it. And so, but the main thing missing from that was staying. So, you know, he's coming at some point. So have him repel down. I don't know. They didn't ask me and they didn't call me. So that's what you got. If bashing Ric Flair was an Olympic sport, do you think he would, (laughs) do you think he would get on the first team or do you think you'd just be part of the reserves for the United States? Oh no, I'd I'd be, I'd be the the lead player. (laughs) I really would. <clears throat> now I don't blame Flair's old. He'll tell you he's old, but to put him out there, and this goes back to Tony Khan. Why would you put him out there where you he demonstrates really how old he is? It's like AEW goes to the nursing home, and that's what they do. 
anyway. Yeah, we shall uh, move. I mean, I can't, I can't talk about guys being old. I'm old too, but I wouldn't even attempt <clears throat> to do anything like that. That requires some movement because I can't do it either. So guess what? I will save myself the embarrassment and the fans by not even trying it. He, uh, he, he's got the gait of somebody who, if he does anything apart from walk in a straight line, he's worried he's going to fall over because he like bends his knees down. He's got the old uh, look, sort of moves like he's about <laughs> shit in his pants. And then he's like, Ugh! <laughs> for a punch, <laughs> I'm like just about to fall over with everything. Oh, he it's does. it's horrible. Anyway, people, if you haven't seen it, or if you want to see it, I mean, you may be sorry that you did see it, but seek it out on the internet, or and you'll see what we're talking about. We are going to move on. There's not really much to say here, but it's a big bit of news, that, but wholly expected. Billy Jack Haynes has officially been charged. He was arrested a few weeks ago on suspicion of murdering his elderly wife, who was 15 years older than him and the mother of his recently deceased best friend, which is a, something we covered in quite in depth a few weeks ago when uh, the podcast was released nearest to that event. And Billy Jack Haynes was released from hospital finally for apparently an unrelated, uh, unrelated medical incident took a couple of weeks and formally was charged with second degree murder that means it's intentional but not premeditated and unlawful use of a weapon in portland oregon well <clears throat> i i hate billy jack finds himself in such a situation i hate that he he murdered that that woman uh but i don't think we'll ever see Billy Jack in a in a trial being charged with that. I think he's mentally ill. And I think the best thing they can do for Billy Jack is put him in an institution where they can house him. And I don't think there's any chance, I think, of, of him killing anyone else. But he he has issues, serious, serious issues. And I can see, see, I usually don't agree with, you know, somebody escaping punishment because they have a, a mental issue. But Billy Jack seriously has one. And he's had one ever since I've known him. And that was actually known amongst the members of the dressing room. So everybody more or less left him alone. So if you know he's messed up and don't make him mad. <clears throat> so condolences to the family of the of the lady and Billy Jack, I hope you uh you you find peace in some way. Do you think because as I'm sure you'll have known, you'll have seen clips over the years that Billy Jack Haynes did a number of shoot interviews where he, you know, over the years with various mm -hmm. people where he's come out with just the some of the most wacky stuff in the world. In a weird way, does that sort of help his case? In the sense that, you know, he's, well, because, he's publicly no, because, made some <coughs> crazy, crazy allegations <laughs> over the years. No, he's, he's nuts. He is legitimately mentally ill. You know, when you, hear, you, when you hear the term mentally ill, you go, well, you know, that, that takes in a lot, of, a lot of acreage and a lot, a, a lot of space. Yeah, it does. But I think if he is examined by a mental health professional, they will, they will agree that he has, he has mental issues. But he always has. And I hate that it manifested itself, I like that word. Mm -hmm. It manifested itself with the death of that woman. And some people, I think you told me this, some people have described it as a mercy killing. I think apparently that's what he tried to tell police was that it was a mercy killing because she was in the end stages of dementia. Well, I'm not totally discounting that because she was 85 with dementia, probably doesn't know where she is. She's in probably in, in turmoil, and I won't necessarily rule that out, but we'll, we'll see what happens with it. When's this... Has his trial date been set? Oh, God, no, no. He's only just been charged. I mean, a trial date could take years. I mean, he might just ask to be... No, has it been Has it been set? Oh, I, uh, best I know, no. 
uh, okay. as we record this. But uh, there's no there's no bail for him, right? I for murder, murder two. If there's bail, then it'd be impossibly high to the point he'd never be able to pay it. So I don't think he's going anywhere, and he might just. Well, they let people out of jail now just with no bail. Just say, well, sign this and say you show up at a at a hearing and then the trial. Just just tell us you'll do that. But I don't think they will do that with Billy Jack is pretty well known in Oregon, that area, because he was on TV there for years. So this is big news there, Billy Jack Haynes. And and if you just met Billy Jack and sat down with him, he's really kind of soft spoken. <clears throat> you wouldn't expect him to to be able to to do an act like he's been he's been charged with. Allegedly, you got to keep using that word. Allegedly, but we'll see what happens. I I, I think they're gonna. They'll just. I don't know what they'll do. <laughs> well, <laughs> what, I, I think, what a hell of an interview! I don't know what they're gonna do. <laughs> no, they'll. You'll probably plead insanity. Well, who knows? Maybe you won't, and they might find him insane. Maybe you will, and they might find him not. Who knows? Uh, apparently, one more thing. Very quickly is. Dremer if he doesn't very, beat his lawyer up first. Yeah, give him the full Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you know, in this very, very late year, supposedly, correct me if I'm wrong, someone, but a couple of people have sent in that, you know when he had that great big white sort of hairdo that sort of flopped down dead straight? Apparently that was a wig. But that looks weird as hell. Yeah. I'm looking at photos of him that's, that's quite recent. and Yeah, that's that a... Wig? That's a sign itself that he's mentally off <laughs> to wear something like that. Yeah. I don't know, but. Well, it makes him look more like a UFO spotter. So maybe it all fans, still plays. Fans, we will, we will follow this, uh, this news as it happens. So if anything happens, we'll let you know. Yeah. Now, the main thing we're going to be talking about, and I always forget to say this at the beginning of the podcast, is we're going to be talking about the main event, as it were, just the death of Ole Anderson. But we're going to leave that towards the end of uh, uh, this mm -hmm. episode because we had a lot of fan questions in. There's tons to talk about. But I'm afraid there's another death to talk about in the wrestling world, and it was maybe a day after or two days after Ole died. Virgil, Mike Jones, uh, passed away at the age of 61. So this news was broken by referee Mark Charles III. He posted the following yesterday as we record this. My dear friends, it is with great sorrow that I bring news from the Jones family of the passing of our beloved Mike Jones, whom we know and loved as Virgil, Vincent, Soul Train, Jones, and more. Virgil passed pe peacefully at the hospital this morning, and I ask that you pray for him and his family. May his memory be eternal. So health-wise, Virgil has been uh, suffered strokes recently. He'd been diagnosed with early-onset dementia. So just over the last few years, it all piled on him. Well, I did a signing a couple of years ago with Virgil. We actually sat side by side. And he was okay that day. He was fine. He was laughing. And, of course, you can't sit down with me and talk without laughing a little bit because I'm, I'm joking around all the time. But his last few years has uh, has been tough for him because I have been to some signings and I would see Virgil at a table by himself with nobody around him. You know, they've taken pictures. You know, they say Virgil's table, look how busy it is. Nobody would be there. But sometimes I heard that he would just show up and find a table and go sit down at it. And the the guy who booked the venue and, you know, rented out the tables and all, would never say anything to him because what are you going to do? You're going to go out there and tell Virgil to leave, and then if he doesn't leave, you're going to escort him out? I mean, that brings attention to yourself. Let the guy go. And that's what everybody would say because he wasn't bothering anyone. But the day that I sat at the table with him, you know, quite a few people came up. Everybody knew who he was. Where was Virgil from? I think he was north. Oh, God. I thought he was, uh, as an independent, he was based in the northeast. So a figure around there. I'll just have a look. But you carry on while I, while I find. Well, I had never really heard of him 
he he came to I read read one time he came to Memphis, but it's. I wasn't there when he came. No, you were in Mid-Atlantic at the time. That is exactly what I was just checking. So, yeah, you were in Mid-Atlantic by the time he got there. Yeah, I wasn't in Memphis. So, but, and I don't even know how he got in the business, to tell you the truth. But he got his break when Vince picked him up, put him with Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase, and they ran like that because Virgil, when he was with Ted, he had some heat. He, you know, he had some strong heat. So, and they finally broke that up. And I think Virgil, he made his WrestleMania match against Ted. And, but my, my, my sympathy again to the, to the Jones family for Virgil's death. He wasn't very old. He was like 61. 61. He was, uh, he was a, a Pennsylvania boy as well. So. Okay. Uh, well, Williamsburg, he was born in, and Pittsburgh, he died in. Where did he die? Pittsburgh? Yeah, Pittsburgh as well. Uh, let me give you a, a couple of things about Virgil Mike Jones. So, wrestling in Independence in the Northeast, Mike Jones got his first national exposure as a jobber on WWF television. I've actually seen it. He was called Luscious Brown, and uh, he looked the part, even though he'd only been the... Uh, I mean, that's why the WWF came a-calling so early in his career, I guess. Uh, he lost in two minutes to Paul Orndorff, but he actually one of the few enhancement town that actually got some uh, notice. Uh, he, as you rightly said, went to Memphis for six months, Soul Train Jones, then back to the WWF where he was Ted DiBiase's manservant. Um, now, I, I'll say this now, is that with all the tributes that go to Virgil, there are, there are two things. Like One is the lonely Virgil stuff, you know, at the conventions that you've alluded to. I'll mention that in a minute. But the other thing is, is that he got 12 years plus in the wrestling business, getting paid well in the WWF and WCW by being an in-joke to the other company, which is unheard of because he was called Virgil in WWF to mock um, Dusty Rhodes, his real name, Virgil yes. Runnels. And then, yes. and then when he goes to WCW, he's named Vincent after Vincent Vince McMahon. Yep. And then later, they change his name to Shane for Shane McMahon. And then at one point, he's Curly Joe as well because he's bald. So I don't get I don't get the curly Joe just because he was bald. Yes, yes, I think he was an ironic curly. In, in the... Well, for a guy to get a job that paid well for twelve years is an accomplishment in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So I'm 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 glad he did that I, I because. Got, yeah. But I never knew I don't I never knew anybody and uh, that was that was his friend. That's what I'm saying. You know, nobody was ever known, oh, well, he, he hangs around Virgil. Nobody ever said that. Or he travels with Virgil. Nobody ever, I never heard that, to tell you the truth. But Virgil was an entity uh, in and of itself. So when you say Virgil, everybody knew who you was talking about, even fans. It's, they it's, probably knew more than anybody else. But the, everybody in the business, when you said Virgil, you know, there was no confusing him with anybody else. Hey, you, you, you know it's a big story, and this is genuine, is that it was on BBC, it was, you know, some web, website, BBC, Independent, Guardian, stuff like that. So many of the major, in the UK, so many major uh, news. Did the UK carry it? Yeah, loads and loads of, like, major uh, news corporations and such carried the story. Did you ever interview him? No. I didn't. Uh, I've heard interviews with him. I, I'll ha I hate to say this now that he's passed away, but uh, an interview with Virgil, I suspect, can, uh, and I've heard him do interviews, is a frustrating affair because he's always doing it in character. And I just want to talk to the yeah. person, if you know what I mean. So it's one of those things I never reached out for in that well, sense. Well, maybe he didn't want to talk to you in, as a person. No problem. Maybe he felt more comfortable being Virgil. Mm. So therefore you couldn't attack him. This is his reasoning, I would assume. That if you did it as Virgil, you attack him where you're attacking Virgil. You're not attacking Mike Jones. Is that his name, Mike? Mike Jones, yeah. Mike Jones. You're not attacking Mike Jones. You're attacking Virgil. And some guys, really, believe me or not, if you want to hear some convoluted reasoning about certain things, it could be anything. But ride with a wrestler and you could hear some really convoluted uh, thinking processes when they think about certain things, I can't think of anything <clears throat> off the top of my head now, but that was since we were talking about Virgil now, that's probably what he thought. He was more comfortable doing Virgil than he was doing Mike Jones. Yeah, and being vulnerable in that sense. Well, and, maybe, maybe. I, and, 
And he did a great job. Maybe he just was just there, but he did a great job of DBIC. Mm. Because when he was you know, thinking, what the hell? And he, he looked the part, and DBIC looked like the type who would have somebody like that. And DBIC was a great talker. And, and those two fit together. They really did. Now, as I say, you know, you got, you know, 12 plus years in the business in one of the weirdest ways possible. But uh, just a little fun fact for people is that apparently the guy who's going to be in the NWO, and I'd surmise this genuinely uh, before Virgil was in, it's going to be the Godfather. And I wonder if they just mm. think, well, we've got a black guy in the NWO and we've just brought Virgil in. So Godfather, we don't need you anymore. And I actually think it was something like that, where that's what, that's weirdly what cost Charles Wright his job in WCW, so then he ends up going back to WWF, and then I say Godfather, he becomes the Godfather afterwards. But I think it was one of those things that weirdly Virgil hey, being hired stopped the Godfather getting a job in WCW. That sounded like a little racism to me. Possibly. I'm, See? Well, quintessentially. But it's one of those things that said, was this a racist move? They, Of course they're going to say no. No, of course not. But well, do- probably... Probably was. Yeah, WCW did actually lose a racial discrimination lawsuit in 2003. So, uh, anyway, um, his most impressive asset really was, you know, it, you cannot take away from that he was a hustler doing, you know, in the conventions in the late years. He was one, of, he was like an Owen Hart type. He would stay with fans, ride in cars. Uh, he, just, he would just save money on the road as best he could. But he always, always in his later years seemed to be on the road. As well, yeah. So he's one of those. I was, I was in, I was at a convention in. I'm trying to think. It's either New York City or Philadelphia. I think it was New York. And I'm already at my table. It was getting ready to start. It's like ten o'clock in the morning. And Virgil comes in about ten thirty, walking in. And you could hear the buzz when he come through the door. Everybody, you could tell somebody was coming. You just didn't know who. And then, you know, you saw it was Virgil. But even though he created a buzz coming in, he didn't. He didn't do very well at the table. And I don't know why. I just, do you know what? I think it's because he's one of those ones who upsell. You know, you'll you'll try and get a photo in. And he'll try and upsell you. Oh, well, you can just buy this and this for da 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 and, and, and you know, give the hard sell in that kind of You know sense. who the number one upselling guy in pro wrestling is? I know. I know who it is. Who is it? Boogie Woogie, man. Yep, sure is. Boogie Woogie will get you from $1 to $10 <clears throat> fairly quickly. He upsells. Even the kids, you'll get the kids saying, ask your mama to get this for me. <laughs> <laughs> but he does he he does very well. I mean, you can't get mad at Boogie Woogie Man because he 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 daddy and he's hugging you and everything. So, and hell, you'll just damn buy a picture just to for him not to make you out to be a tight wide. There's there's one more thing I want to say is that obviously you know the famous photos he sort of ended up getting a new lease of life weirdly from the lonely Virgil stuff in the conventions, but his sign always said. Uh, Virgil WW, sorry, uh, da, 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 da. the first one is Virgil superstar. Wrestling Superstar. And then the second one on the table that would be draped over the table would say Ted DeBasey and Virgil WW <laughs> Superstar. He misspelled DBRC. <laughs> and that was actually, it, it fit his gimmick. Yeah. And Ted was never there. They just put yeah. Ted DBRC and someone would come up to him and say, oh yeah, Ted's nipped off or whatever for a. Does, does Ted do a lot of signings or no? Yeah. He was he uh, yeah, he was in Manchester last year. But yeah, he does quite a few. Mm-hmm. Saving up for his legal fees, I guess. And you just had to bring that up, didn't you? Before you did. Well yeah. But... <laughs> how was how was that going, by the way? Slowly. No word on that for months. And I gonna do nothing there. Now what? to the kid they might. Because that's like embezzlement, right? Yeah. Oh, Brett's, the younger kid, Brett's already pleaded guilty, and then Ted has been indicted many counts, but Ted Sr., not yet. Well, 
We'll see. You know who else is involved in that too? And he's a well-known NFL figure, Brett Favre. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you say his name, Favre? Yeah, apparently I was saying it wrong. I was saying it in the something about Mary Favre, <laughs> which is a joke, apparently. <laughs> well, that's the way I used to say his name. Well, it's his a French name, is... name. That is how you pronounce it. <clears throat> well, I think it's they they pronounce it now Favre, I guess. But but I wish all of them. This is a case study in uh, just states not watching their budget. Mm. Misappropriation. I mean, they, no kidding. And I don't think you can. And I'm not saying this because I like Ted and his son. But the state let it go. They let it go, get through. So they they weren't doing their job. So if you're going to cast blame, let's let's cast it all around. And the people with the state, they should be nothing else, kind of relieved of their duties and assigned somewhere else or go look for another job. As I turn my heating off, uh, I'm going to ask you the next question. Now, I don't know what you said about this, but you wanted me to bring it up. You said elsewhere something about John Cena that apparently engendered some... Negative feedback. So, John Cena, what happened? <clears throat> well, he gave a statement about Vince, Vince McMahon, and the the accounts we have read from the 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 girl, the lady that sued them for trafficking or whatever the charges are, but. And he issued a statement that says, I'm going to love who I love and the way I've loved them. But the way it came off is like, well, forget the crime. If there was a crime, allegedly, let's forget that. And let's forget what Vince did. And I'm just going to remember him for what he's done for me. And he was like, made me like $50 million. <clears throat> That's what he's saying. And I heard something a long time ago, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that if you want to look at a crime, say, on a, on a woman like this, imagine your sister or your daughter or a friend or cousin. Imagine them in the same situation and make it personal, and then it all looks differently. But Janelle Grant sitting out there as an unknown face at this point, an unknown individual, well, you can kind of look past it and just go to Cena. I mean, uh, and just go to Vince. And Vince is, uh, and Cena was talking about him like, uh, like he's not guilty mm. at all. See, he, he didn't even make any uh, any gestures toward if he did this. You know, I'm, I'm, he, he needs to be punished. He didn't even add that in. Now, we can get by with the, yes, I, I loved him. He was a great human being to me, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but if you got to add that little disclaimer at the end, if he did this, he needs to be punished like everybody else. It, we, now, Randy, Randy Orton did that. Hmm. And I, I think another guy, I think... Uh, Seth Rollins yes. did. Uh, Kevin Owens did, in fact. Uh, but you gotta, you gotta add that in there. I, see, that's saying that I don't know if he's guilty or not. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not saying for me, but the, the people, they don't know if he's guilty or not. But if he is, here's my disclaimer: if he is and he did these things, yes, he needs to be punished. Then you can get by with the statement. But he got a lot of heat. <clears throat> it's almost like he's saying. Uh, he's forgiving Vince already. It sounds like not he's baking even... him a cake with a file <clears throat> in it already. It saw his way out the bars. Listen, uh, I thought it was actually something different that you said about John Cena that people were getting at you at, and it was something to the effect of John Cena wasn't that great of a wrestler. Oh, yeah. Oh. Which, which I'm pretty sure that what? Cena would have been. Yes, he was. Uh, Cena will admit it. 
that he's not that great a wrestler. Well, well what, did, what did you say about it then, that, that you were getting hate Okay, mail? this is the, this, well, this is the way you look at it. Uh, see, it, it's not how great a wrestler you are that considers you great or an immortal or you're a candidate for the Mount Rushmore Hall of Fame. It's how much money you drew. And Cena drew a lot, a lot of money. He sold a lot of tickets. He sold a lot of merchandise. Therefore, the company made a lot of money, and he made a lot of money. Now, is he a, a technician like <clears throat> Brian Danielson? No. He never intended to be, but it's the... He was over with the people. They liked the rap stuff. They liked this. And he's really kind of, if you watched him, I worked with him. <clears throat> he's kind of a little bit awkward. Of course, I was a little bit awkward too because I worked with him late in my career. I could probably hardly stand up anyway. But he, he wasn't a great technician in the ring, but he was great on interviews and the people he connected with the people, that's what gave him his term great. So, and I can name you a few. Was Hulk Hogan a great wrestler? No, he wasn't. Was Steve Cold, uh, Stone Cold, Steve Cold, <laughs> Steve Cold. was Stone Cold uh, Steve Austin a great wrestler? No, Steve was Cold the was. Undertaker. Who? Steve Cold was. Oh, Steve Cold. Yeah, oh, he was great. World he should have been in a. He should have been an independent Hall of Fame. <laughs> the Undertaker. The Undertaker wasn't a great wrestler in the ring, but he played the character and he drew a lot of money. So that that's what I mean. But uh, people people assume that oh, I'm 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 dogging him. I'm not dogging him. I'm just saying. If you sit down at a table with a bunch of wrestlers right now and says, was, was, uh, was he a great wrestler? They'd all say, well, not really. And he wasn't. Randy Orton used so to say he used the shits when they were working together, when they were both in WWE. Who's this? Randy Orton used to say, God, Cena. Oh. Oh. Yeah, he's... Just, yeah, stiff no, but, or whatever it was he said, you know. Now, you talk about working. If you compared Orton and Cena straight up, head to head, Orton, uh, Orton beats him three to one. Mm -hmm. Easy. Cena drew more, yes. so he was better. But Cena drew more. He was more over with the people. And it says on the, you know, it says pro wrestling. And pro means professional. And it means the ability to actually make money, and that's that's what it is. John Cena drew money, made money for everybody. Now, if I'm in a building and I'm running a concession stand, a pizza stand, and all of a sudden I look at the card coming up, John Cena. I said, "Whoop, that's a money night for me, buddy." Because just hearing the name knows it's going to be full. Are close to full, which means that you're gonna your business is gonna be good. So take take that for what it's worth. Of course, I've never sold pizza in a building. Sometimes on some of these payoffs, <laughs> mm -hmm. then I got in the rest of the business. I wish I had been selling pizza; I'd have made more money. <laughs> Next up, Elimination Chamber. Did you watch? The, I asked you to watch the main event, but that did necess, necessitate going on to uh, Peacock and hunting it out. Did you watch it? No, I did not. Oh, we'll Is on. that bad? Is that bad? Yeah, it's fine. We'll move on. Uh, Maxine. Well actually, well, actually, this sort of like plays on with it. Uh, Maxine Dupree, booing. So. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention, I mentioned <clears throat> Elimination Chamber first because Rhea Ripley actually had a tweet out about Maxine Dupree, but here's the story itself. A number of WWE female talents have come to the defense of Maxine Dupree, formerly of your favorite WWE faction, Maximum Male Models, as she's been struggling with wrestling since transitioning into an in-ring talent and on and off televised events. And during a house show a couple of days ago or weeks ago, whenever it was, Maxine got booed out of 
the building. So Rhea Ripley wrote this on Twitter. I really wish that some of you got booed and ridiculed in the public eye while being new at your job. Learning and getting better is all a part of being human. Be better as humans. So essentially we have a very green wrestler getting booed for a subpar performance as the fans saw it. Is this an overreaction by Rhea Ripley? Do people need to be more understanding? No. I agree and I disagree with uh, Miss Ripley. I really do. Fans pay money for a ticket. They expect that performance to be like the other WWE performances. It needs to be just a little bit close to it. But apparently, uh, Maxine Dupree's performance that night wasn't anywhere close to what they would expect. So therefore, their fans, they can say whatever they want to say and then determine whether they want to continue watching WWE or buying tickets to their live events. That's their right. Uh and what uh, Rhea said, yeah, fans need to put themselves there. Yeah, they do, but they don't. And they are completely valid in their criticism of it. And But by the same token, they bought, they bought a ticket so they can voice their opinion. I think everybody is right here and everybody is kind of a little bit wrong. So you can't blame the fans whether they like it or not. That's that's their prerogative in buying a ticket. And I think Rhea was just taking up, and apparently they're friends, you can tell, and, and Rhea likes her, which is great. Now, maybe the girls will get together back there and make it a joint project to help uh, Maxine out a little bit. I read that she didn't really train that much at NXT and they brought her up too soon. Yes. And which is, which is a problem because this really is not her fault. If you, you want to stretch this out and really assign blame to a lot of places, you've got to assign the person who brought her up too soon. That'd be triple H, right? He brought her up too soon, and you also got to assign blame to the performance center because they didn't get her ready in time, and so and you can't blame the fans because the fans are just they're just reacting to what they've seen and the progress that uh, the performance center made with her, which is a an indictment of the performance center, I, I believe. And Rhea, I, I kind of congratulate her for taking up for her for her fellow uh, wrestler in the back. But it's uh, you almost have a, a a victim here of that. Who is the victim here? I think it's Maxine. She's the ultimate victim. It's not the fans. It's not anybody else. It's her because she's doing the best she can. She doesn't didn't go out there and intentionally screw things up on purpose. She's doing the best she can. So is that the best non-answer you've never heard? No, I, it's a perfectly valid answer, quite frankly. And you're right, WWE ultimately is, I mean, they're putting her out there. And yes, house shows especially are for improvements, but also keep in mind that half of her matches pretty much have been on TV. She wrestled on NXT in like a six or eight person match one time. And then she's rushed. Okay, wait a minute. Up. She was in an eight-man tag? Or an eight-person tag, an NXT. That's the only time and, she had a match before going to WWE full-time. And, and she, they was, pick, she was a manager. They picked her. She was the manager, and they picked her out? Well, she was the manager. She's been a manager on WWE TV. I know that. In a while as well. But, uh, yeah, she, I don't know how much what she's they, trained. What, what were they booing? Oh, no, no, no. It, when they were booing her, that was a match. Okay. What I'm saying is that she had one match ever in NXT prior, and this is mm -hmm. you know a year or two ago. And it's well, WWE's this is what they, I think this is what they're going to do since in WWE now. I think they pay attention to their criticism, 
a lot more strongly than they probably did before when Vince was there. And I think they'll take this a little bit closer to the vest than what they took criticism before. And I think uh, Triple H, he doesn't like criticism like that. I don't blame him. But I think they will make her a pet project, and they may send her back down to NXT if they're going to use her at all. Because I think there is money with this girl, I think, because she looks great. Uh, and let's see what they can do with her. If they take that project and they can turn her into something, you know, more power to them. But just because you go to NXT and you train with the best, in-ring best, doesn't mean you actually get the business. You understand what I mean by saying get it? Yeah. Well, people, when they go to the ring, you know, if they can connect, and I talk a lot about connectivity with performers and, and fans, if they can connect, she didn't have to worry about really wrestling moves. Like Dusty Rhodes, just take Dusty Rhodes for example. As a wrestler, he couldn't do that stuff. He didn't do arm drags and drop kicks and that stuff. He did boogie woogie and move around and do his hands like Handsome Jimmy. Handsome Jimmy is another one. But they drew tons of money. They sold tons of tickets. And that's what promoters look at it. And if you can excite fans, that's it. That's what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. if you can excite fans like Dusty Rhodes. I mean, that's rather that's an extreme example of sort of, you know, yes, it is. connecting with the fans. But Okay, let me, let me put it this way. Uh, what if she was in ECW in the 90s and wrestled a subpar match? She would have... With the reaction of the fans there, she would have quit the business that night. Are people just soft these days? You got a bit of booing. One person said, Maxine, you suck. That was it. I mean, <laughs> hey, this is just 2024. Do... I mean, God, cowboy up. Just deal no, with it. <laughs> fans bought a ticket. They can say and react however they want. Exactly. Uh, my, I, thank God she wasn't in Philadelphia. Mm. Philadelphia, even back 20 years ago, they were brutal, even if you were good. You know, they, hey, Dutch, F you, man, blah, blah, get a job. This. <laughs> and that was I Jerry said, Jarrett. Oh, yeah. That was Vince. <laughs> that was Vince. <laughs> but, but, uh, but they were brutal, but they can, but we knew uh, about the Philadelphia fan. We knew uh, about how they were, so we went out. But we embrace that, that the fans are going to be against you. Even if you're a good guy, even if you're a baby, baby face, they could be against you because they live for that. They live to get a reaction. And when you realize that, then you, you can go ahead with your stuff. Ah, oh, dear. As you say, paying fans. I mean, got, fans go, they, they pay the hard-earned money to let out their aggressions. I mean that's right. part of that's part of the contract as a performer. If you can't take a bit of booing, I mean, if it's something like incredibly personal or hurtful, then I get it. But you know, you've had she's had thirteen matches, and they're putting her on TV. Yeah, this was a house yeah. show, but they're putting her on TV wrestling as well, like two minute matches and stuff. She had a, a, a struggle okay, did this against match, Ripley, did... in fact, recently. Was that on TV? With Rhea Ripley, yes. Um, the house show, See, I don't even know. Rhea, who, Rhea who, Ripley doesn't even, she didn't have, Rhea Ripley doesn't even have enough experience to put her on TV in a, like a squash match. She doesn't know what she's doing yet either. She doesn't, I don't know if anybody has taken the time to really explain pro wrestling to some of these people. Apparently not. But you got to be set down. And sometimes some people respond to yelling and, you know, really getting on somebody. Other people, uh, other performers respond to people talking to them in a calm way and explaining wrestling in a rational way. And you got to find that what they respond to and, and, and see if they get better. But I, but I've never been a screamer and a, and a hollerer, I say, because th that to me gets you nowhere. You know, you might as well say, come here a minute, sit down, blah, blah, blah. 
and let's, let's try it this way. And you got to watch them every night. That's why the territories were better because when I brought a green guy in, say I brought him into Memphis or I brought him into Puerto Rico and I would go out there and I would watch his match. And then when he come back, then I would sit him down for a five minute critique. I didn't spend a lot of time with it and tell him do this. Don't do that. Speed this up, you know, get a little higher on your drop kick, work on it, blah, blah, blah. And see, that's why the car trips years ago was really an extension of a training session because we would go and have a match and I was green as hell. And we'd get in the car and we'd have a few beers. And first of all, now the few, the veterans, they didn't, they didn't know me. And I wasn't a friend. I was just like some guy coming in off the street. And I might, I might not even be there next week for all they cared. But then they'd have a few beers and I would tell the guy, did, did you see my match? Um, I, is that what you call it? Then they loosen up. Then they start kidding. I said, yeah. What do you think? Oh, it's a shit. It's horrible. Blah, blah, blah. Get a job. But then they would kind of accept me a little bit. Then they'd start helping me and slow down. You're way, way too fast. You're trying to sell the people on the mat, <clears throat> not trying to make it look like you're running a, a, a speed race. And everything they said had meaning. And that's basically how I learned the business. Sitting in the back seat of a car on the way back, not on the way down, because I was doing the driving on the way down, but on the way back, and I could, I was probably driving on the way back, but they were telling me all this stuff that I could do to improve my work. And that's as good as a training session. And I got it for free. And I got, I got advice from the, the top workers in the business. And these days, if you messed up, someone else will tweet, don't be so mean to that guy. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, did you see the little girl who sang the national anthem at some song, at some game, basketball game or something? No. Uh, she's about eight years old, nine. but And she was a horrible singer. Oh, they just lambasted her. I don't think they booed her when she left. I don't know. But she was out there in red, white, and blue dress, and it was a, like America the Beautiful, or uh, and she was singing that song. Mm -hmm. Go look it up, and you, you just got to hear it. Even the basketball players were doing this. Oh, my oh. God. This, they was afraid to let their faces be – because they, they were laughing. But they didn't want their faces out there because people would get mad at them for laughing that little eight year old. And they should, but whoever put her out there needs to be lambasted. They need to be bull whipped at sunup. And the girl <laughs> busted her ass. She sang at the top of her voice. She was just off key. But I'm, I want everybody to go see it. Look it up. The little girl singing the, the national anthem or, or at a basketball game. I don't even know who was playing. Now, that's a very prescient story there, Dutch, because our next thing is Max Caster's rap fail. Uh, I sent you the video of this. Tell me and everybody what happened. Well, he he just hit a blank because it happens. And the reason I know it happens, it happened to me. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of times I would do my... I would do my interview in the ring, you know, but they wanted to get my entrance in. So Vince says, I'll tell you what, pal, let's have him do the interview on the way to the ring, which was not, not a bad idea, really. So one night I'm going, I did cut the music, cut the music, and then we would start down. Or maybe we would start down, then I would start saying, cut the music, cut the music. And I would come all the way down to right where I was about 20 feet from the ring, and the camera's right in front of me, and I'd cut my promo. So one night I'm cutting the promo, and I got to a part. I, I just went blank. And I leaned over to, <laughs> to, 
I never will forget this. I leaned over to Swagger and I says, I forgot to MF an interview. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, say something. <laughs> I says, uh, and as I was saying, <laughs> and it kind of, when you saw it back, it kind of looked like it was set up, but I totally forgot it. Because these writers, they think they're like, Hemingway in the back, they're writing all this stuff out and blah, blah, blah. And I would read it and I said, oh, I'm not saying that. And I, mean, I wouldn't tell them that. I'm not saying this. And I would just cut it all down. And guess who never see who was a stickler for staying on uh, reading the, the whole interview was Vince. Vince had it right in front of him what you're supposed to say. And if guys didn't say that, he would just lambast the hell out of them when they come back through, uh, through the, the go area. But when I would come back and I would do about half of it, then I'd make the other half up. Guess what Vince said to me? Zero. He just didn't say nothing. You know, and he's like, good interviews, Elby. And then I'd go. Never said a word to me. And the reason I attribute to that, and, and I will say this about Vince, I owe a lot to Vince because he helped me out in a time in my life where I really, really needed, needed help. He did help me out, and he never, he never got on me about anything. And I knew I made mistakes sometimes, wasn't in the right place or whatever, not many times. But he never said a word to me, never. And I attribute that to, where, to my longevity in the business. Vince has been around 50 some odd years. I've been around 50 some odd years, I guess. And he kind of respected that I've made it this far in the business. And that's the only reason I can uh, attest that he never really, really got on me. He never did. And I don't think he, but in this situation where we were just talking earlier about Cena and some of them saying something about Vince and not even saying anything about what he's allegedly accused of. I mean, it looked like they were almost forgiving him. But we'll see what – I'm on two different subjects now. But Well, well I'll, I'll bring up Vince in a minute, actually. Uh, we'll just briefly back on Max Caster. As you say, he's, he goes down the thing, and he just draws a complete blank, and then he just goes – sort of freezes. And it's really obvious that he's forgotten his lines. What is a good trick for, let's say I'm Max Caster or whoever you are. I mean, I've got the hat for it. Um, and I completely go blank. It's always good to have like a plan B in your mind. It's more difficult when you're trying to do a rap, you know, off the top of your head or, you know, something you just scrawled in the back. But what is a good plan B to always fall back on if somebody forgets their lines and then give you enough time to get back on track? Well, if, if I knew that, everybody would be doing it. But not everybody forgets their lines because these lines are, this is his gimmick. This is his deal. So he's got to figure that out for himself. So if he can free wrap, he should have put something in there. How many lines did he miss? Oh, the whole verse? Oh, Lord knows. He missed enough. And then everyone, oh, and then it sort of just peed out. But in, but in doing that, this is what I think the fans do. Oh, well. But it was obvious he he forgot it. Is that what you thought? Oh God, yeah, it was completely well, obvious. Yeah, <laughs> it was completely obvious. I think people will forgive you for that. They said, "Well, he forgot that," and I think they're more proud of themselves for catching the miss than what he, uh, than he was guilty of forgetting his own lines. And how long how long did he pause there? Oh, the video only goes like 20 seconds and he pauses at 10. And then, yeah. it, and then it shoots the guys in the ring and then like it just completely falls apart. Sticking on Max, and because you mentioned Vince weirdly as well, this sort of fits in. Hang on a minute, perfectly. hang on a minute. Oh, hang on. Can There's you hear barking. that dog? There's a barking dog happening, one sec. Go ahead. Okay, okay. right, well, carrying back on. The dog bark for two seconds, delivery man. Now, a few weeks ago, and, and this goes to, like, man, I don't want to live on this planet anymore. 2024, everyone gets butt hurt, crying over everything they could possibly cry about. Uh, Max Caster was on a independent show. He does a rap a few weeks ago. And the quote was, 
reference in Vince McMahon to some guy who was facing the ring with, you want to try me on the mic, get a different plan, because I'm freaky with the words like I'm Vince McMahon. I'm freaking on the words. I'm, I'm freaky with the words like I'm Vince McMahon. And? Oh, I'm sorry, that was it. That was everyone everyone f- getting out their pram, throwing the toys out the pram, thinking, how dare you mention Vince McMahon? It's topical. I don't see that. I actually thought that was pretty good. Yeah. Do you know what I was I mean, said? listen, listen. If you can't talk about Vince McMahon, it's it's something that happened. And he's in another company anyway. Now, this would take on a different uh, importance had he been a WWE guy on the show. But, of course, WWE guys, uh, WWE doesn't allow their – their talent to make independent shows, but he's an AEW guy speaking about another promotion and people want to get butt hurt about that. Oh, Screw God. them. Do you know what I would have done? I would have said, what would you, you want to try me on the mic, get a different plan because I'll shit on your head. Like I'm Vince McMahon. That would have been about a rap. That is terrible. Come on. That would have gone down. Great. <laughs> Like that Lindor you've stuffed that, in your that, mouth. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I was wanting to laugh, but I, I, I got to have a, uh, have a piece of candy. That it was pretty good. That was good. Come on. I, I, I would laugh. He needs, he needs, he needs to hire me for these raps anyway. Um, <laughs> I, have more stuff. <laughs> I have more stuff about Max Caster. We'll leave it for there. We're going to move on to this. And something you particularly interested in, MLW settlement worth $20 million. It was released, uh, revealed in WWE's latest public filing for, you know, the stockholders mm-hmm. and such, or, sorry, TKO, mm-hmm. uh, public filing. On January 11th, 2022, a complaint was filed against WWE by MLW Media LLC, captioned MLW Media, blah, 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 uh, alleging that WWE interfered with MLW's contractual relationship with certain media platforms and engaged in other anti-competitive and unfair business practices in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act and California law. On December 22nd, 2023, the parties notified the court that they had entered into a settlement agreement in the amount of $20 million and stipulated that the case should be voluntarily dismissed with prejudice. Wow, I I think we both figured out that MLW would have got a little bit of money, but $20 million, that's quite a lot more than I that's, thought. Yeah. That's quite a little payday. So who's the guy that runs MLW? Court Bauer? Court Bauer. Brother, if I was Court Bauer and they wrote me a check for twenty million dollars, I'd say, "Well, boys, it's unless I was making pretty good money off the uh, off any of the uh, affiliate stations I have." But I would have took that twenty million, banked it away, took a vacation, disappeared for about six months anyway, and then come back fresh with a tan and and restarted. $20 million. Now, let me ask you, I, I've often thought this. If somebody gets, and fans, I want you to know that you can actually get a more of an education than just wrestling here. This is a legal question. If you get $20 million, now you're going to go by UK law. I'm going by US law. If you report that on your taxes, do you have to pay taxes on that? I or no. don't know. That's a really good question. I don't know. I'd assume yes. Does it count as a... Because it's a different thing with gambling win. I know this isn't gambling. But in this country, gambling winnings are tax-free. Whereas I know that's not the case in the States, and it depends on the state you're in. But um, I wonder... I wonder... Does certain okay, compensations uh, from the government... If uh, any tax uh, attorneys are out there, write us and... T- and, and Answer the question. He was awarded in California. So does he have to pay? I'm in California, they're taxed to death anyway. I wonder, does he have to pay California tax? Mm. Even though he lives, I don't know where he lives. I think, does he live in Georgia? Court Bauer? I've no idea. But if you ever talked to him? No, I've never have you ever talked to him. To him? No, I know, well, it's fine. He doesn't, he doesn't, so. he, he doesn't, he doesn't, I know he doesn't like you though. That's fair enough. Add him to the list. Yeah, I was talking to him one day, and he said, who's that damn goofy-ass co-host you got? I said, hey, don't say nothing about James. 
in fighting words. I'll See, I took I t- twenty million. I t- no, I, I took up. I, t- <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Don't talk about James in fighting words, buddy." <laughs> so, you, but twenty ever, million, have twenty million. Have you ever talked to court? Have you ever had yeah, any MLW yeah. dealings at all? A few, a little bit, but not about. It was about something else. It was about some running drugs across the border or something, you know, but yeah. with all with all those Mexicans down there he had. <laughs> <laughs> how how far does twenty million dollars get you in professional wrestling in twenty twenty four? I mean if you've got like some sort of a mid sized level wrestling company like MLW. I mean they just hired Matt Riddle. No, I suspect it, it, for seven figures, I guess. I had to get you a while. It will. Because then you could afford to lose a little money and then not panic. So, but 20 million, if I was court, I'd have, I'd have put up for sale what I had. I'd just leave the rest of the business. And just then, then you get a podcast, then you can just talk about it. See? See, it doesn't cost me any money to do the podcast. So, oh, but they'd and, be bound. They'd probably be bound by confidentiality or something like that. So maybe that's the one thing you can't do is do a podcast. Well, how do we know that tw- he got twenty million dollars? Because WWE that... announced it. I mean, they have to oh, though, they... because that's an expense that they have to declare. <laughs> they did. Yeah, yeah. So they announced they announced it. Oh yeah. Because the stockholders have to know that exactly. So now, but the people know. Hey, if Court Bauer owed me owed me some money. Now would be the time to hit him up for it. You say, hey, about that five grand you owe me, blah, blah, blah. And then he can't give you that, oh, business is bad, you know, this, that, and the other. You say, no, you got $20 million. So cough up my money or I'm coming down there and I'm stomping you a while. Rightly so. Do you think MLW were in the rights that they deserve this $20 million? Are WWE, in your opinion, guilty of monopolistic practices? Oh, I'm sure WWE, they've been doing that for years, too. That was well known years ago because Vince, when it comes to business, he plays as dirty as as he has to, sometimes dirtier because he would do this and he would do that. And see, when he, he took over, say he took over Channel 5, no, he, he wanted to come to Memphis, and the Memphis wrestling was on Channel 5. Well, he'd go to a competing station, and he would pay them, say, Channel 3. I guess they got a Channel 3 there or whatever. But he would pay Channel 3 just to run the show, like an infomercial. Mm-hmm. And he would give them... What was funny to me that that he didn't give them money right at eleven o'clock in the morning to run directly opposite uh, channel channel thirteen. I think that's what Memphis was on, and that's playing dirty. Really, you can get another station to play at a different time, but to run head up against the local promotion—that's saying like, "Screw you, I'm after you, and I'm gonna go after." Because if the and the territory was on its last legs anyway, that was like saying this is the final shot to the brain. We're going to kill you off completely, and he, and he did that in a in a lot of areas. Because by the time the WWE got going and other and the people realized there was another bigger, better, more polished with music and it's a show, it's more entertainment. And the regular wrestling show, which is, you know, in a little studio that held a hundred people. Well, yeah, Vince would win out. There's no going, there's no going back Mm. from that. You're not going to go back to the farm after you've seen the lights of Hollywood. That's the old saying that goes, but you know, Vince always played dirty and he got by with it because he had more money. He had more power and he had more oomph than the local promotion did. Because, and this is uh, pretty well sort of tied together, actually, because I mentioned Matt Riddle 
being signed with MLW. It, 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 as soon as they got 20 million in the bank, then Matt Riddle signed to MLW. Matt Riddle did an interview. This isn't about MLW, by the way. Uh, Matt Riddle was on the MMA Hour with Ariel Helwani, and he discussed his WWE firings. So just let me switch the page, and I'll... Whoops, I've switched too many pages. Here we go. I feel like getting fired by WWE happened at the right time. Not saying I won't go back or saying I will go back. There's no discussion there. But at the same time, I just had another kid, little Matthew. And with the WWE schedule, it's a lot. I think there was a, uh, multiple variables that played into my departure. Plus, like I said, I failed a couple of drug tests. You know, for me, at least the writing was on the wall. <laughs> I, 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 I failed a couple. Yeah. Okay. He slipped that in, didn't he? Oh, it happened at the right time. Uh, yeah. Plus, you know, all those drug tests have failed didn't hurt. You know, the, the whole leaving thing. <laughs> I'm very good. In- but also by him saying that, that says, well, I fell one. They let it go. You see what I mean? Oh, they. Sus- he was suspended at one point. So I think he was suspended for like 60 days at one point. But in fact, he, he mentions more about that in a second. So I'm very good in the ring. I'm entertaining. But at the same time, especially with WWE and how they want to be perceived, I don't think I was a good fit, at least at the time. You're allowed to smoke weed. I went to the strip club and did some cocaine a couple of times, and I failed a drug test for that. Just just a couple. And uh, that was for all of them. It was cocaine each time, but honestly, it was just random nights. WW, yeah, yeah, just random nights that just so happens to pop for cocaine that stays in your system for 48 hours maximum. Uh, and, you know, just bad luck there. WWE tests you randomly, say, any week, but sometimes you get tests at the end of one month and the beginning of another month. So there was one week where I failed bang, bang. I got two right at once, so I think that's why they're a little bit more lenient with me. So he had so much cocaine in his system, he got two failed tests in a, in a, a, sort of consecutively in mm-hmm. that sense, and they treated it like one. Well... You know you're going to get drug tested. And some guys, this is where you make the mistake. Some guys try to figure out the frequency. Hence my story about Bam Bam Bigelow. Yes. Have you heard it? Uh, we've talked about it on uh, this podcast. Uh, okay. No oh, well, give us the short version for people well, who haven't heard it. They used to test in, in, in the garden. In the garden. So... We went to the, uh, on a Saturday night, we went to the garden, Madison Square garden or Boston garden, and they did a drug test. Okay. Bam Bam Bigelow was expecting it. So he said, okay, I got through this one because marijuana stays in your system for like 30 days yeah. or something like that. Residual, yeah, can do. Yep. And so as soon as he left the garden, he was going home. I well, he just fired it up. He fired two up on the wood just the way home. It was like an hour drive. The next day he's going to some town that was not far, maybe a hundred miles from New York City. Hell, he fired a couple up then. <laughs> and he walks into the building and they never test consecutive nights. But he said he thought just because they tested in the garden. They wouldn't test again for 30 days or more. And he smoked a couple of joints and walked in and said, drug test tonight on the wall. Well, he went and took it. And, of course, he failed. <laughs> and he had 30 days, 30 days off. But one time he didn't. This was a regular occurrence for Bam Bam, I think. Because when he gets 30 days off, you got to think of it like this, too. His opponent also has to take those days off because not only is he uh, punishing him, they're punishing the guilty party. They're punishing who he's working with too, because now that guy has a night off and bam, bam did go in and he said, listen, it's my fault. I did it. And I forgot who he was working with. Say it was uh, anybody, but he went in there and offered to work, for free just so the guy could work too and get paid. Now I thought that was a pretty good gesture on, on Bam Bam's part. So he said, I'll work. You don't got to pay me. And just so this guy can work and get paid. I'm sure like stuff like that and going home for a month. And, and yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's a, that's a true story. Uh, well, it's a true story. Uh, if you leave out stuff I made up. 
is, is, is as true as I could get it. Yeah, you need an asterisk. Just always have the <laughs> asterisk, don't worry. Yeah, like oh, the look, like. <laughs> is Matt Riddle oversharing here? Because, I mean, it's not, I mean, cocaine's still got far more of a stigma to it than, you know, than weed does. I mean, is it? Is I don't it, think now, I don't think now it does. No? It's so commonplace. I mean, you have to, the football players and the baseball player and the bat, you know, they're all doing it. So, and it's no secret. It's getting caught is the, is the bad part of it. And I don't think the people care about that either. Now they've heard so much about it. It's not like you just going out and taking an ax and chopping some guy on the legs and chopping his leg off. But that maybe that's me. Maybe I read too much about it. So I don't put a lot of stock in it anyway. Uh, Matt also said, well, he's currently performing with New Japan Pro Wrestling. He's signed to MLW. He's making appearances for Japan. And he's currently their uh, world television champion in that promotion. My next but, question, my next question is for you, and I don't know this answer. Okay. Does New Japan test? I don't think do they any- test, but I mean, I think as be- best I know, they don't do drug testing. Who knows? I might be wrong. I don't think they do. But Japan's very much more traditional than the United States when it comes to matters such as this. I mean, I remember a few years ago, Taka Mishinoku, he was with a promotion. It was found out that he was cheating on his... He had an extramarital affair, and he was suspended by that promotion what? for a year. An extramarital affair? Can you believe in wrestling? God, that is a no-no. Yeah. But, but they're, you know, they're more... They're not as liberal, let's say. More yeah, conservative in so. these matters. I wonder if this is going to affect a stand with Japan. Well, just by going by what you said, it, it won't. You said they're more, well, you just say they're more conservative. Yeah. I doubt it. Matt Riddle also said this <clears throat> about his wife. This is more oversharing, but this is a funny story. His uh, wife was cheating <laughs> on him. I think it was about a month or two later, and I came home, and she was like, I want a divorce. Yeah. She yeah. was like, I want you out of the house. I got my stuff and said, sorry to the kids. A week later, my kids hit me up and were like, why is Zach's football coach living here? And it was my son's PE coach, Rob. Nice guy, though. Nice guy. But this guy, uh, I'm like, Rob, he's a teacher. He's nice to my kids. He lives there. My ex-wife and him are together now. That was literally a week after he left. So that was probably going on for a minute. I was traveling and always gone. So... Mm. So there's two perils of the wrestling business there, overindulgence and cheating on each other, essentially, and him getting kicked out of the house for the PE teacher. What What's that got to do with the drug use? Nothing. It's just around Nothing. happening at the same time. It was the same interview he gave. Well, all he's got to do now is pay child support. Or not pay child support. No, he has to pay child support. I don't care what she did. He's still got to do that. Isn't that the kid's fault? I was going to say, it's the wrestling business. I mean, how many times have we heard so-and-so arrested for not paying child support after 15 years because they finally caught him? He was off the road for two days. Well, touchy subject. Oh, so, oh okay. I will move on then. Now, well, not with me. I was going to say, yeah. Not, not with me, but it's just, you know, it's according to what anybody's uh, individual personal experience with it is so i've never had to deal with that with matt riddle uh where do you see him ending up eventually do you think he'll be back in wwe or is he just too uh, is he too on the fringe for a major promotion do you think how old is he now oh he's probably late 30s now i think well Maybe, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. Going to be wants to get back and who his is. At, and it uh, also depends on his relationship with Triple H. Wait a minute. But also, if Triple H is still there, which this thing with Vince may, it may affect that. Okay, we haven't talked about we haven't talked about Vince today much, have we? No, uh, we have Vince coming after one more thing that you told me to talk okay. about. Okay. CMLL deportations. No, I asked you to talk about. I didn't tell you anything. 
I took it as a threat. And, uh, the the old saying is, you can't tell me nothing. You can ask me something, but you can't tell me anything. Oh, okay, no, no, go I, no, I took it as a mortal. Uh, <laughs> in terms of my life, I didn't. PW Insider has reported this. The United States work visas for nearly 20 CMLL stars in Mexico are in the process of being cancelled by the United States government. Once that happens, it could take months for new visas to go through the approval process and be issued. 19 luchadors, including a Volador Jr., Her- I would blow this guy's name, Hechichiro, or Hechicero, sorry, and Mascara Dorada. Uh, they've all appeared on AEW uh, as of late as well, as well as Blue Panther, uh, Dulce Guardian, um, El Sagrado. I'm going to blow loads of these names, but essentially 20 of them have, uh, excuse me while I switch the page, and a referee are expected to be impacted and unable to perform in the United States. So, in speaking to sources close to the situation, the visa blow-up is a result of a Texas independent wrestling promotion called Full Blown Pro Wrestling, which runs Laredo and who had essentially sponsored the group visas for the CMLL talents, running into issues with CMLL management over the course of the visa process. So, essentially, some some third-party promotion who was working with CMLL has had a blow-up with CMLL, and now that the person who was sponsoring it is no longer involved with CMLL, now 20 visas are on the line. And this is a big well, deal I, for AEW as well. Well, I think they had a blow up with the immigration people because of all the talk now about <clears throat> this is what happened. They've had a girl around Athens, Georgia, who got killed by a immigrant who came across the border. He just walked across. And they don't know who he is or what he's charged with or this, that, and the other. But, but he killed this girl. She was a, I don't know if she was, she was a nursing student. And that has really upped the talk about the immigrant, the border. Because the border now seems to be just unprotected. And when you have a million people walk across in a year, I would say it's unprotected. And... So with with this coming up, it was the independent promotion that was supposed to deal with these visas. Well, they just didn't bother with it. And the reason they didn't bother with it is, well, hell, they can walk across anyway. Why, why should we get involved in this and paying money and doing this and, and be on record? And they just didn't do it. So now they got caught. And AEW uses they use some of these guys so it's going to affect them there and they say and i don't know somebody can correct me but i don't know how long it takes to get a visa but i'm sure it's not it's more than a week it can be months it can be months. this could be and sometimes even lead to years according to it's government mm. they take their time and because there's no need for them to speed up it's not going to cost them any money so I'm sure it's going to uh, affect AEW and at least get those guys to at least get a work application so they can come and work in the United States. Now, that's not just going to affect CMLL. It's going to affect all those other Mexican wrestlers that are coming across the border, working in California and Arizona and uh, wherever they work. Bureaucracy is, you know, a frustrating part of modern life, I'm sure. But there was an example I heard this morning. Uh, the Bollywood boys, who were a tag team yep, I know them. in WWE. Anyway, they had to get visas, right, to uh, uh, WWE. One of them got him absolutely fine. Not a problem. Mm-hmm. Got the visa straight away. The other one of them couldn't get a visa for months and months and months and months and months. And I don't think there was any difference in their background or whatever. It's just the arbitrary bureaucracy if or where one person slips through fine and the other one is held up for check after check after check. And what do they call the Bollywood boys? Uh, I know them. They were in with... TNA or, or were they there in no, WWE while you were still in, there? In, in India. Ah. TNA went to India and we had them there. Nice guys, laid back. So, uh, and they work good. And they used them because, of course, we were in India, and wh- wh- where where did they live? Uh, they were a Canadian professional wrestling yeah. tag team. Yes. Uh, the yes. real names were Govinda and Harvinda Sira. So that was their real <laughs> name. So there you go. That's that's a good 
bro name. Uh, what now? What was the last one? His name? Govinda. Uh, Govinda and Harvinda. <laughs> yeah, that's great names yeah. to have, isn't it? Just shorten it down to Al and Bill. <laughs> well, actually, it's, it's Al, Gov Al and Hoff. wait a minute. This is Al and Bill sing. Let it go like that. That's all they got to do. Yeah. It's funny. So they're, they're, they're Canadian. Canadian citizens, and they still can get the. Have you ever tried to deal with visa stuff trying to get into Canada when you were with? Oh WWE? my God! I, I swear to God, you could you could take a trip quicker. I'm trying to go to Canada one time, and I stood there, and I stood there, and I stood there. Now it was not an excessively long time, but I spent about thirty minutes or forty five minutes at the window, and the guy would, you know, there. They, let me put my glasses on here. The guy would look at me like this. He'd put his, he'd put his glasses on, and then he'd he'd look up at me, and then he'd put them down and look at me, and it just went on and on. And what is your business? <laughs> yeah, that's it. What is your business in Canada, sir? And I kept pro wrestling. He said, "What? He must have been hard to hear." And I, I like to have never got in. Finally, I got in. Now, getting out is no problem. Getting in is the problem. And I'm thinking now, if an American has to fight so hard to get into Canada, and these Mexicans are these, not only Mexicans, but all nationalities, can go to Mexico and just walk right across. If you miss the border checkpoints, and it's 2,000 miles long or 1,500 miles long, so find a lot of ways to cross over the border without without getting noticed. But, yeah, getting into Canada was tough. Hey, getting into the U.K. for me was just went right in. Mm. But I was with a group. Now, that may have helped because I was with the WWE group. Now, uh, and I'd, I, I just I'm, went right in. I wanted to ask you this. Did WWE sort out your visa issues for uh, you? Oh, everything. I didn't touch anything. They had everything. That's because they're organized. They know what to do. And the people at the immigration office know WWE. And <clears throat> I had no problem whatsoever. I just went right in. Except when I went right in, we got kicked off the plane huh. because we had had a party on the way over. Not me, but the other, the rest of them. There was food on the walls, on the ceiling, oranges, bananas, um, milk spilled, everything, you know, drinks. There was a knife. Somebody threw a knife. It was sticking in, into the wall of the plane. And when we got over there, I think we were on British Airways. And when we got over there, we were informed, our, our, our you know, group leader, which was Jerry Briscoe, I think. They told him that we would not be, and we were going to, I think, Munich, and we would not be allowed to continue the flight on British Airways to Munich because we were basically, we got kicked off. And of course, you can know Vince. That's what you get when you get a bunch of wrestlers together for a five hour, you know, closed in session. When there's alcohol, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're liable to do anything. So they kicked us off. So I can hear Vince now, them son of a bitches, bastards. But he didn't handle it. Somebody else had to handle it inside the office. So, but we took another, another airline and got over there. We, I'm sorry, everybody. We are going to have to deal with one bit of Vince news. And it's not really Vince McMahon, but it's sort of, you know, the wider net of uh, the Ring Boy scandal and back into the 80s, and specifically Terry Garvin. Now, <clears throat> we're going to mention the quotes from Nick Kaniski soon enough, but I want to do a quick uh, addendum. Okay, who is thing. Nick K K Kaczynski? Kaniski. In the, you're thinking K Kaczynski is the serial killer. Which one's the serial killer? What was his first name? Oh, no, it was Kuklinski, wasn't it? You have lost me. Kaczynski was a serial killer, though. Oh, there was a Kaczynski, Kaczynski and a Kuklinski. I guess. Lord. 
You're confusing me now. Yeah, no, okay, sorry. Nick Kaniski, who is the son of Gene Kaniski. We're going to get onto him in a minute, but before we do, there's a quick addition for last week. We were talking about Paul Romer and his quotes to News Nation, I think. I didn't write it down, but I think that's what it is. He was talking about Jim Powers and his run ins with Pat Patterson, Terry Garvin, that kind of thing. But then he also talks about an old tag team partner of his as well, but didn't give a name. And we sort of said, uh, well, it's probably Hercules, or I said it's probably Hercules, because that was the only other tag team partner I remember. And uh, Paul Roma said the guy left WWF rather than have to deal with uh, comings on from somebody in the office and said it wasn't worth it, wasn't worth the Benjamins, and he left WWF. And he said that later he died after suffering a bleed on the brain. Well, apparently he was most likely referencing Special Delivery Jones. So, I mean, there was a 20-year period between him leaving WWF and then hitting his head and dying. I think he had a stroke and then hit his head and he died on a bleed to the brain. But I just wanted to add that before we <clears throat> carried on. Very briefly, you never met S.D. Jones, did you? I never met him. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've caught your cough. Because I never do special delivery stuff. I just do, like, regular mail. Yeah, second class. Third Cheaper. Class post, yeah. We will... Um, Okay, so here's Nick Kaniski's quotes from Post Wrestling. So this is the first time he's ever said this publicly and allowed it to be published, but he has told other wrestling journalists over the years this story, but then just said, "Just that was for you, don't ever post this. So anyway, Terry Garvin, here's the quote. Now that is, wait a minute, that is like a stupid statement. What? You're telling a reporter, don't report this, but... Oh, but no one did. No one ever did. He was, yeah, but if you're saying it... I don't know. Go ahead. Oh, well, there you go. Anyway, so this is to post wrestling. Terry Garvin would come up to me and hit on me. I want to say, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't got my glasses on. I'm actually going to put them on for this. Lights got darker. I won't say what he said, but you'll understand the meaning behind it. He says, hey, Nick, let me perform oral sex on you. You can read a Playboy and you'll have it made for life. So <sighs> it's like, anyway. And you know he's my boss. He controls my boss. Uh, this is my livelihood, what I want to do. I kind of joked with him. I said, hey, Terry, you know I'm not that way, but if I ever change, you'll be the first. I'll let you be the first. We just kind of laughed it off. But he was always kind of coming up and joking, and one time he came to my hotel room late at night, and I told him to leave. Knocked at the door, so it put me in a very awkward position. There's no doubt about it. Hey, if you let me do this, you'll have it made financially for life. I mean, there's no other way to take that. I remember where it was. It was in Milwaukee, Oregon. Milwaukee, Oregon. Uh, he We wrestled in Portland. I called Vince and I said, hey, Vince. Wait a minute. Was it in Milwaukee, Oregon, or was it in Portland? You know, it says Milwaukee, Oregon. So, and then, uh, anyway, Portland comes into it as well. I called Vince and I said, hey, Vince, I don't think this is right. Terry's hitting on me. I don't appreciate that. And I would like it to stop. And Vince said, oh, okay, I'll deal with it. And that was it. I talked to Vince and said, this isn't right, Vince. I complain, and now you guys are punishing me. I'll finish my bookings. He's been jobbed out by this point. I mean, he was only yeah. really in the company for like nine months. But I'm not putting any guys over. Put me in the ring. We'll see what happens. Vince knows I could take care of myself. So he said, no. I said, I'm done. I said, I'll finish my matches. And then Vince said, nope, you're done now. Thank you very much. So Vince fired him that night. So this says one of two things. Uh, Terry Garvin. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, Vince knew, because he's been told more than one time, and uh, there's a pattern with Terry Garvin saying, do this thing for me, or let me do this thing to you, and I'll make sure that you're uh, well, uh, you know, career-wise, uh, well compensated. You know, Vince could have done that even if he had allowed it. Terry Garvin's not the boss. Vince is. So what if he had gone? <laughs> what if he, he had, say, just he laid there, he was looking at Playboy, it was, it was getting done, and then Vince calls him the next day <laughs> and finishes him up. He says, well, we don't need you anymore. So I don't know. That's his story. I don't really buy that. It could have happened. More likely, who gives a crap anyway? So... I don't know. Well, do you know what it is? Is that with the Terry Garvin thing, I mean, I believe that Terry Garvin, because it, it, quite a few people have come out and said this. I think yeah. even Barry Orton said this once when he was a young man uh, before WWF. The bit that's sort of difficult to quantify one way or another is if he didn't go through with it, that Terry Garvin, well, one of two things, Terry Garvin would have 
either halted a push he was getting or he could have made his career. So it's like, is it an idle threat? Is it an idle promise? No, it's an idle threat. <clears throat> That's what it is. Listen, the guy's name was what? Nick? Kaniski. I don't think you're going to draw sellouts with that kid, period. He may have been an all right looking kid. He may have been okay to Mr. Garvin, but I don't think you could draw flies with the guy. I really don't. So if he had complained, Nick, Vince don't get Vince is running a, a multi million dollar business. He don't have time to to listen to this kid who's in first matches, second matches. He means zilch to the overall product. And probably he made the right deal. Whether the guy had said, I'm not putting anybody over, or I'm not doing any job, he don't care. He was done with him anyway. And in Nick's defense, I mean, not Nick's, in Vince's defense in this, I don't blame him. Just get rid of it because there's a thousand guys you could put in the first match. He could probably walk out in the crowd and find some independent wrestler to put in there. Maybe he did a better job. So, well, I think K uh, Kaniski, is that his name, Kanitsky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think he just needed something to say, so he said that. Yeah, no, I mean, he was basically a body, you know, during his WWF run, and then, not that it was much of a run, he was, he was basically prelim talent, and then he was just doing jobs for the most part in the second half of what turned mm -hmm. out to be a nine-month or ten-month run or whatever it was in the WWF. Um and what years were these? 86, 87. They weren't making any money anyway. Yeah, the prelim guys wouldn't have been making any money. Um, I don't think the main event guys were making any money then. What, 86? You must be kidding. This is Hulkamania time. This is the, the coin in it. Well, yeah, but it's according to, according to the shows they put you on. Ah, well, okay. If you're you on could the be on show, those second. You, yeah, if you're on that C show, you're down there with whoever. Nick Kaniski. <laughs> <laughs> you're down there with him and Terry Garvin. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, Terry, he was bored. He wanted to do something. So, but, uh, yeah, I've seen, the, I've seen the main event guys when I was there, it was way, way down. Huck wasn't there. It was, and some guys told me they have never, they've never made less money. And I'm thinking, well, you've never been to Memphis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can make less, uh, less money there. But but if you were there during the boom times, you made money. If you didn't, well, you had to deal with the Terry Garbage, I guess. Yeah. Um, let me, I'll put it to you this way. I mean, if, let's say, it's the mid-2000s, and this could well have happened, somebody in WWE goes up to a woman and says, hey, if you let me sleep with you, I can, you know, make sure that you get higher up in the card. And apparently it happened. So we mm -hmm. hear rumors here, there and everywhere. Yeah. But I mean, whether it's a man or a woman who's been put in this position, I mean, it's a horrible position to be put in. Allegedly, if this all happened the way it says, it's a horrible position to be put in. Even if you're said, it's, it's implied that if you do something, you will get rewarded. It's almost implied that if you don't do it, you will get punished for it. And it's and you know it's a terrible sort of position to be put in, like with the Ashley Mazzaro thing, and these that same thing. She was getting knocks on the door supposedly from Vince, and that puts her in a terrible, terrible you know dilemma in that sense. Oh, it does. So all I can say is nobody was, no woman was knocking on my door at one o'clock in the morning, at all. So when I went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> in my room alone i woke up i woke up alone and no guys were knocking on my door either so as far as that uh that goes i don't i don't know what i would do but you are in a bad position especially if you're just starting out in this business you don't know what to expect you really don't but you damn sure don't expect that you might expect something at the matches and they tell you to do something or this and you're talking over, but somebody at two o'clock in the morning, you get up and you look out and it's one of the agents, it's Terry Garvin. You go, what the hell? 
Of course, first you might say, is anything wrong? And the, he would come in your room and sit down and <clears throat> I don't know what to tell you, tell you. I don't know what to tell them or what I would tell myself, but yeah. uh, well, I guess know. I would just, I guess I would just get a playboy. <laughs> Start reading. I know. I just like, <laughs> it's like, if nothing else, just hey, how that is romantic. Not, that is not funny. And this is a serious subject we're talking about. Yeah, I know. Just, just so you take else. it seriously and don't make a joke out of it like you always do. Why don't we move on then to our main event as we were. <laughs> Ole Anderson has died at the yep. age of 81. Now you've dealt mm -hmm. with Ole over the years. Uh, Alan Robert Rogowski, the real name. One of the top heels of the Territory era, an original member of the Four Horsemen, an owner, a part owner of the Georgia promotion at one time, as well as at one point one of the highest paid and most respected bookers in wrestling. Ole Anderson died at the age of 81. Uh, I also didn't realize that, like you, he was an army veteran. I only found that out today. Uh, he was stationed in Germany prior to his wrestling career. I didn't, I didn't know that either. There you go. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of uh, tweets of tributes. Your old friend Ric Flair has said, I am forever thankful to Ole and Gene for bringing me to Crockett Promotions as a cousin. It launched my career. I will be grateful forever for you giving me the opportunity be uh, to become who I am today. We didn't always agree with each other, but the honest to God truth is you and Gene started me. Rest in peace, my friend. Ricky Morton said, rest in peace, Ole Anderson. You taught me so much in professional wrestling. You were tough as nails. You will be missed, my friend. And Tony Schiavone... Came out with the best one. I am brokenhearted about the death of Ole Anderson. To many, he was a grouchy, cantankerous, non-apologetic, battle-worn son of a bitch. But to me, he was a friend, a mentor, and a man I held in high regard. He taught me a lot about pro wrestling, a lot of which still applies today. I grew up a fan of the Anderson brothers, but became a bigger fan of Ole the man after I started in the business. Rest in peace, rock, and make sure to tell someone in the afterlife to go F themselves daily. Yep. That was his favorite. That's that's his favorite saying. To you? No, to anybody. Go after yourself. You tell everybody that. Ole was one of a kind. And to me, was hilarious. And he didn't... I think he kind of meant to be funny, but it came across... I laughed at that guy... And he intended for people to laugh anyway, but he was serious. He would say it in such a way that if something went wrong, I think he'd say, oh, I'm just kidding anyway, lighten up, blah, blah, blah. But, and of course, I've told the story here when he said, I can fire you, I can fire you, and, and go on. Uh, but he was a hot, hot heel for a long, long time in the mid-Atlantic territory. This is b before Atlanta. Him and Gene were hot. I mean, they had heat. I mean, you could see steam coming out of the fans' ears. They were so mad at them. They just they couldn't stand them. Because Ole had a way of doing an interview that you took personal. It's like he's talking directly to you or your family, and you... And you it, it, and that's the kind of heel that's worth gold. Because the people, they said, I hate that son of a... And people did hate him. They hated him so bad. I've talked about the night in Greenville, South Carolina. When he walked out, the guy cut him, 76 st stitches, and he cut him from like right here down to the belt line. He went like, and cut him. I think with a hawk bill. You know what a hawk bill is? No, it's got a hook on it or something. Or... It's got a hook on yeah. it, so when it goes, it's hooking. And you will hold that meat all the way down. 76 stitches by the time they got through with it. And and then Ole made a, made a joke about it later. Said they were looking for an old guy who looks like he has dementia. And then Ole says, and 30 minutes later, they arrested Gene. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was his joke. But, and he probably, he came back to work after about a week, I think, not in the ring, but he was there, showed me, showed me the stitches. And, oh, they look, not, he's still bandaged up, but, 
it, it looked bad. And Ole, if you – and he was a cantankerous, malcontent, racist bastard. But there was something about him that made you like him. Even he could be cussing you out, but cussing you out in a way that you felt like, well – if he just calms down, he'll be okay because he would go into rants. And when he'd go into rants, it was it was a performance. And when he would go into a rant, I would just sit down because I didn't have a cigar then, but if I did, I would just sit down and enjoy the rant and nobody else would say nothing to him. And he would have this whole fit, a conniption fit, I call it. He would have it all by himself entertaining as hell. I wish I'd have got it on tape. And and he would bring, whoever was in his line of sight, they would be brought into it. And he would be talking, say he was talking about Tony Schiavone, that Tony Schiavone, that stupid son of a bitch, blah, 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 blah. Then he's talking about somebody, then he'd talk about Jim Hurd, then he'd talk about damn Barnett, and then who, then he would look at me, Dutch, Dutch Malady. He'd bring everybody in it. So anybody who was bothering him at the time or he just happened to bounce on or see, they would come into the conversation. And then he'd just stop. And then he'd go on and go do something else. He was unpredictable as hell. But I liked Ole, and his health hasn't been good. And my condolences to his family. And I don't know if he was still married or whatever. I saw him at some signings. But I don't know how – did he have dementia to at the end a little bit? Lord, do you know, as embarrassing as it is, I didn't even write down what he died of. I'm not sure that's been released. I can try and find out. But, yeah, he, he seemed to have ill health for many years. Was he in a wheelchair for goodness yeah. knows how long? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I remember many of the days he was the – he was almost the epitome of the, of the classic heel that you just hated because you know for gene to get that much heat gene couldn't talk his way out of a traffic ticket i mean gene is very soft-spoken and he doesn't talk a lot so Oli was his was his great counterpart that did the talking for both them of course the famous angle are we going to talk about that later We'll talk about that later, yes. Um, we actually had a lot of fan questions coming. I'm sorry, I'm about to have a pill. Um, to people who don't like him, Oli was nothing more than a bitter, ignorant, sarcastic, cantankerous, bullying, racist, disrespectful, stuck in the early 90s and 1970s, malcontent. And to the people who liked him would pretty much say the same thing, it yeah. seems. But, um, what was it? Hmm. But, uh, but I liked Oli because Oli liked me. Because he would go in these rants because he saw that I enjoyed him a little bit. So he would come up and start going into a rant right in front of me. And I just look at him and it looked like I wanted to laugh, but I didn't. But he could tell I wanted to. So he knew he was getting to me and entertaining me. And he enjoyed that. So, and I think if Ole had fired me and I went up to him, I said, Ole, don't, don't do that, please. And he'd hire me back. <laughs> That was the kind of relationship, I may be totally wrong, but I think if he had fired me, I think I could go and talk to him, even if he was really mad. I think I could go and talk to him, and he'd reverse the decision. He said, I'll make you bookings and shut up and stay out of my way. Something like that. He'd get the last word in, but he, he, he was the boss. Now, uh, we've got a lot of fan questions coming in for Oli. So, uh, first one, Hassan Malik, what was your first impression of Oli Anderson? And more specifically, I'll add this in, when was the first time you met him? Was this during the Anguncle Georgia Wars or was this later on? No, I, it was later on. I knew of him and I saw him when I was growing up because he was good from day one. I mean, you noticed him because I was a fan but when he come on TV and I heard that interview, I immediately says, this guy, it, I didn't know what I was talking about, but this guy is noticeable. You know, this guy's around and he did some classic, classic interviews, even before I knew the whole score, 
but I noticed him and they had heat. They had, and cause I would talk to wrestling fans. Oh, I hate that Ole Anderson. I hate those Andersons. And he was a godsend for uh, Gene and for Lars. See, actually out of the, did I like Ole? I liked uh, Ole. I didn't like Lars. Lars was a smart ass. I couldn't stand. I ended up getting the fight with him. I, I told you about that. But Ole, I never come close to having even worse to. And Gene never talked. Gene, they was like, Lars didn't say a lot, and Ole did. Gene didn't say nothing, and Ole said everything. So, and when Gene came along, that was the end of Lars. Because I don't think you could get heat with Lars if you doused him with gasoline and threw a match on him. I think it was the other way around. So I think Ole replaced Lars. Because it was Gene and yeah, Lars Ole, first. And oh, then, yes, yeah. Ole, Ole replaced Lars. That's right. Um, let me ask this one. Uh, Mark, oh dear it, Mark, Mark That's weird. Uh, oh, sorry, Marcus Hester. I'm sorry. I just all these letters run together in these usernames. Was Ole ever nice? Did he ever smile? And what made him laugh? Oh, it, he laughed all the time in the dressing room, but you would never see him like break a smile. You know, he would laugh. <laughs> well, he'd laugh it was with a like frown. That. Like, ho, ho, yeah, ho. it was. <laughs> and he was he was like in a mood every night. You just didn't know what it was, you know. But I've seen him, you know, I could, guys can make him laugh, but he would laugh, but he would laugh at his own stuff. Only is hard to describe, but, you know, when he was, when he was, when he was pissed, you knew it. Now, when he was pissed working, you kind of knew that too. So, but yeah, he, he laughed at jokes and he, he would get around. Uh, Andrew Machado was asked, was there anybody that Ole Anderson actually liked RIP Ole? So who, who were Ole's favorites back in the day? Well, he liked the ones that could make him money. I think he, personally, I don't think he liked wrestling too, but he knew he had to deal with him. So he got along with him and he's been called a racist, but who he liked a lot was Thunderboat Patterson. And he made a lot of money with Thunderboat. Cause you got Thunderboat hot, uh, in Georgia and he, he pushed him like a, he pushed him like a son of a gun. You ever heard one of Thunderbolt's commercial uh, interviews? Yeah, great talker. He didn't say nothing. He was no, I just want to say. He had so much charisma, though. Yeah, and he sounded like a, a, a black yeah. Georgia holiness preacher. If you move, <laughs> if you move. If the uh, yeah, that's all he would it, say. It's great. And he, and he had that one eye. Is I don't know what happened to that, but he drew someone a moved. Ton, <laughs> yeah, he 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 drew a ton of money, and Ole saw that this guy is marketable and pushed him like a son of a gun. And he was Thunderboat was was the Black Dusty because it wasn't his work. Damn sure it wasn't his work. Even with Dusty, it wasn't his work. It was his interview because you liked him. And you felt like, like you said, you felt like you were being preached to. And if you move, oh, Lord. <laughs> and it was good. It really was. It was. It's funny that you mentioned preaching. Tony Atlas, when I interviewed him, told me a story. And he said he got into it, Thunderbolt, with, with some other wrestler. I can't remember. Uh, might have had the name Tank in it or something. Um, <clears throat> Thunderbolt knocked him spark out and then he got over his body took out his bible and started quoting bible verses at his unconscious body so I, was like, I, I believe that I, I would believe that yeah. I, wrestling's a weird hey, business sometimes man. A weird I mean there's there's no telling <laughs> I, and I didn't even know Thunderbolt that well so imagine if I'd known him well some of the things he would have told me, some of the things he would have done, some of the things he could have, you know, just described. I'm kind of 
of the things I missed in wrestling, knowing Thunderbolt a little better is one of them. Our next question is John Alunil, I believe. Uh, is there an instance where you saw Oli do a very nice act for someone that revealed that he wasn't just a mean old ogre, like so many shoot interviews claim him to be? I have a hard time believing that Oli was mean and angry all the time and didn't have any compassion for anyone, like so many wrestlers claim Oli was in shoot interviews. So do you remember Oli really going out of his way to do something nice for someone for the sake of being nice? No. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I never have. <laughs> Let's, uh, no, we've talked about the race. So your first memories of Oli was with Gene, then I take it. Just watching as a fan. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I take it you don't remember him when he was Al the Rock Rogowski. If it was no. that just an AWA thing? Yeah, I don't think he came south with that. No. Uh, Oli replaced your friend Lars Anderson, who you best remember uh, for stories uh, that you've told about him and getting a fight with him in the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. Uh, you've, you, you alluded to it before, but just Oli and Gene as a team, what did they mean to wrestling and how good were they? I think you even nominated them for, when I asked you, as a Mount Rushmore of the greatest tag teams of all time. I think you said Oli and Gene as one of them. Well, they wouldn't be out of place on that the Hall of Fame of wrestling tag teams, they wouldn't be out of place. I think one of the, and, and they, they wrestled and they used the old style. And I never even heard a, even a commentator bring this up. But if, but if you noticed the great tag teams back when I started out, they had a, they had a theory or, you know, a, a match plan to keep your opponents in your half of the ring. And like from corner to say you had this post and this post, your opponents and you, well, the other post, that's where you try to keep your opponents. And it's just a talking point, really. That's all it is. But it, if you think about it, it made sense. Keep your opponent in your half of the ring to where, you know, you're closer to him than his, uh, than his partner is, which you, if you had a announcer bring that up, it makes sense. So I noticed that about them. I noticed that also about the assassins, but they had a, uh, they worked on story more than anything else, but they didn't have any fantastic spots they did or anything else. It was just Beat your ass wrestling in Oli's interviews, and that's what they went on for years. And they could do that because he drew money. They drew money. And then they would change. The, they kept the Andersons together, but they would change the teams mm. that they went against. Of course, that's wrestling anyway. But they would change the, the teams up, the makeup of it. you know. And, and when they got uh, Steamboat there, and he teamed up with a, another young baby face, they still sold out. They still had a ton of heat. Because at one time at Charlotte Territory, you, he couldn't have gotten any hot, hotter because they were selling out. When you sell out Greensboro Coliseum, 21,000 seats, that's a Madison Square Garden thing. But when you go to Greensboro, North Carolina, and you sell it out, that means you're drawing from South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Baltimore, Kentucky, you're drawing anywhere that that TV goes into, and people would make the trips to Greensboro to go to that show. Now, <clears throat> uh, I had a couple more questions that we're actually going to skip. How's my mustache look today? Very symmetrical. Very good. Very good. Stands out Thank well. You. Stand, standing Thank out you. well. Thank you. Uh, next question. Conan El Barbaro uh, with Dusty Rhodes and Power as Booker in Jim Crockett promotions in 86 and 87 when you were there. Mm -hmm. How was Ollie Anderson's demeanor after spending so many years in the role as a booker and then not being in power and Dusty Rhodes as being the booker instead? Well, it was very, very tense at the beginning. But I think Ole, he disappeared shortly thereafter. He was the booker. There was a lot of dissension between Ole and Dusty. Because Ole felt like Dusty campaigned against him, which is probably true. All right. He probably did. It's a business. And 
I mean, Ole would cuss out Barnett, which sometimes isn't the the best thing to do to your boss. So he called Barnett on on a bad day, and you know Dusty and I think he was bringing Dusty in anyway. And Dusty would see, it was a big show, so everything was geared. Dusty would be on top, and all the angles would go in this big show. And then Ole would top it off. But but I think Barnett, he was told by Dusty that, hey, I can do a lot more here if you just bring me in here and let me control it. And, it's, and, and a wrestling booker is like a football coach, a pro football coach. They get hired to get fired. That's all they do. As soon as it goes down, it stays down a month or two. Well, let's change the coach. Let's change the booker. That's basically what it is. So you change the coach, but the coach can't then start being a player because then the head coach and then the former coach are going to get into it somewhere, some way, and it's not a good working uh, situation, a good working environment. So I think when Ole got out of the booking job, I think he stayed around just long enough to to honor his two week deal, and then he left. We can let's briefly talk. Did you see the video? I sent you a video. It's like ten or so minutes, and it was sort of a. Uh, it just happened where was it uh, Ole and Dusty versus the assassins in the cage, and then there was Ivan Koloff and Gene. Anderson as the two guest referees, and then it turned out to be one great big setup where all five of them turn on Dusty and attack him. Uh, did you watch, you know, the promos and back and forth with that video I sent you? Well, I've watched them before. Mm. I was running out of time this morning, but I've watched them before. Perfect, perfect setup because the people loved Ole being a good guy because all those years of pin up hate. <laughs> For Ole, now they could just go full blast and say, now Dusty and Ole are, are together. So now we got a new super team. And brother, when that happened at the Omni, they had to call out down extra police because they was wanting to kill Ole. And I think if they could have gotten to him, I think some violence would have been done. It was about an hour or so before they could even leave the building. But it was a perfect, perfect setup place. I don't know how many people hit hoes, like 18,000. It's not as big as the Greensboro Coliseum, I don't think. But it was jammed, packed, and perfect setup. But then after it happened, all of a sudden, I think Dusty had some – uh they didn't have Dusty back that much. Well, that's what I was going to ask you because I, mean, I, I don't know. Huge but thing, I don't and then know. It just petered yeah, out after I'll, a few weeks, and, and then it went to crap <clears throat> because Dusty was booking Florida at the time. So, and then I don't know what happened, but Dusty quit coming. But this is a, a, a reason that a, a lot of fans never hear. Dusty may not have liked his payoff. And Barnett may not have made it up to him somehow, but you never hear that. So if he's not going to make any more bookings, you got to just dump the whole thing. But to a fan, he said, wait a minute, what happened here? Because it's the reason is underneath the surface that you don't see, they don't advertise. And a couple more people may not have liked their payoffs either. And, but I think that's what happened. Mm. I think. Did you like your or, payoffs from? Or, I was going to say, did oh, you my, like your payoffs my, from Oli? <clears throat> from the from the Omni. Well, yeah, from the Omni or Oli in general. No, oh, they were okay, but it was Barnett making the payoffs. Now, some payoffs say you can take the payoffs are different. If you really sit down and think about it, say you got. $10,000 to pay talent, and that's on a $30,000 gate. And uh, you got 14 guys on the card. Okay. Divide 14 into 3,000. Um, Divide 15 into 3,000. Can like you do that, Rick? 
uh, what, 15 into 3,000 is 200. Well, get you an average payoff. Say it's $250 if you paid everybody the same. Say it's $300 if you paid everybody the same. But you're not going to pay the first match the same thing you pay the main event. Well, let's knock down the first match to 150 Say, this is 40 years ago. We're knocking down to 150 And 150 back then was like 500 today. So knock it down. The 150 and uh, the main event, if you pay them all the same, 150 Well, you can't pay them 150 so you got to take that money you saved in that first match, move it to your main event, so your main event makes, say, 1200 And which wasn't a, wasn't a bad payoff four ways. And then you middle the card would make like three hundred dollars. So I think everybody would be would be happy. If you don't like your payoff, you go and complain to the guy who made it, which is the promoter. You said I don't like my payoff. He said, "Why well, I, sh I should have got this and this and this." And if you want to keep the guy, you just say, "Okay, I'll get you some more money." And you next week, I'll get you more money next week when the, we run this next week. And you wait on your money, and it comes in. But the money didn't come in off the houses. It comes in from the other talent. He just takes it from the other talent and gives it back to you. So it's not like the promotion is spending more money. No, that means the uh, the underneath talent make less money. But they don't tell you that. Uh, One yeah. of those un yeah. under underneath uh, secrets that I uncovered. On the interviews, you go, you can put me down with a steel toe boot. Baby, you can put me down with the steel toe boot on the carriage. And I was thinking, all these interviews with Ollie and Dusty I was watching this morning, with wrestlers today and thinking, God, he's a great interview, he's a great promo or whatever. If you transplant the best interview promo of 2024 into 1980, they wouldn't be in the top 50 of no. promos. The, no. The standard's so much lower these days. Ollie was great. But, Dusty was even but better. But this, this is the difference between today and yesteryear. You know how many times they would do that same promo back in the day in the 80s? Not like 30 for every local market, they, yeah. They do it for every, yes, local market, every town. They do it. The same interview. You couldn't put me down with a steel toed boot, baby. And they would feel the same enthusiasm. But you you, you <clears throat> try today in WWE, they don't, they, I don't think they know how to react to that. They really don't. Well, they cry when they but get booed now, these but, days. But you had. You had the guys back in those days doing their own promos. You didn't have a writer sitting back said, well, Gene, if you'd say this, or Ollie, if you'd say, Ollie, say, get the hell out of my way. You know, I'll do my own interview. You don't got to tell me nothing. Actually, if you had a guy trying to tell them how to do their interviews back in the day, they'd have got cussed out and told to get out of the way. Now, the booker could say, hey, this is all they would tell you back in the day. <clears throat> okay, you're you're in Atlanta on the 11th of April at the Omni. Starts at 8 p.m. You got this guy in, in a no DQ match. Just give you the particulars. You say, let me let me tell you something, Atlanta. Mark this down. Imagine uh, Thunderboat getting this. If I could just tell you what I'm going to do. So. <laughs> So he gets you to thinking about April the 11th at the Omni, the Omni baby, <laughs> downtown. And at eight o'clock, you know, they get that in and he and his opponent and the interviews would go 90 seconds. But in those 90 seconds, they put out all the information you need and where to get you and then the, where to get your tickets, follow it. And so you know exactly what's going on. Just to wrap up this little bit of the uh, Oli Dusty thing is, what what do you think the Oli Dusty real life issues were between each other? Was it just purely professional jealousy, or did it was jealousy? It else? Jealousy. They just didn't because Dusty thought, and Dusty was a pretty good booker. Oli was a pretty good booker. They both drew money. They drew money in their respective character. So you had, and it's hard to continue a run in a territory when it's red hot. And Ole didn't separate that from business. 
and he thought uh, he thought Dusty went behind his back, which he probably did. Or Barnett was thinking about getting rid of him anyway, and he wanted Dusty to take the job or help out more. But Ole, he took that as a as as an affront to his effectiveness as a booker, and he he just see. It can never be. This is this is life in general. It can never be your fault. It has to be somebody else's fault, right? So blame somebody else. Don't blame yourself. Don't blame and say, "Well, uh, the territory got away from me and it got down, and therefore they made a change." And because it's money, it's your job. So you're not you're not going to do that. And uh, Ole and Dusty were always at each other, kiddingly. But down deep, it was a shoot because Ole would call Dusty a big fat son of a bitch. <laughs> and Dusty would call Ole a big fat son of a bitch. <laughs> but they took offense, but nobody ever saw it. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. The only ones that knew it were, say, Ole's close buddies, if he had any, and Dusty's close buddies. And he had he had a few. He had a, like a little click that followed him and that he took with him when he would go places. So that's what it was. It was more professional jealousy than anything else. Now we've got a few more fan questions about Oli. We'll try and get through them uh, all quite frankly, because you've got to talk about Oli. You know, he's a big star. We can't shortchange him on the time. Very quickly before we talk about Oli as uh, the fan questions, I've got to mention a couple of quotes that he said. And keep in mind, this is a guy who was claiming an IQ of 170-something. Was <laughs> He didn't see anything of value in Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Mm -hmm. He didn't see anything special about Randy Savage for Heavens to Murgatroyd. Hulk Hogan was nothing special. He was just a big body guy who sold dolls. And quote here, I called him Sterling Golden and he wasn't worth shit. Um... <clears throat> He also thought that Ric Flair as a wrestler was merely okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, this is Ric Flair, for Christ's sake. Anyway, and also uh, he claimed, Ole claimed that he had to get rid of Flair from Georgia because uh, he was killing the Georgia Territory. And that's why he voted for Ric Flair to get the NWA world title, to get rid of him out of Georgia. It's like, <laughs> is he just making this crap up? He's basically saying like four of the greatest, in various different ways, wrestlers in the history of wrestling are all terrible in one way or another. Professional jealousy again, because if he knew, if he got them in there and they drew some money, then they would have power in talking to Barnett because they have drawing power. Therefore, they have, they have worth, they have substance. So if they ever got Jim Barnett alone and presented him with a, uh, an option then Jim had somewhere to go. And Ole would say, well, I'm working against myself if I really get them over. And yeah, I'm, I, I, I got to agree with, you know, Hulk Hogan. He, he needed the vents to get him over. He needed that machine to get him over. And I don't know if Georgia had that machine to get Hogan over like he got in New York. I don't know that. Well, well AWA, uh, he was getting himself. I mean, uh, WWF just imported the Hulk Hogan character as we know it or knew it in the 80s from the AWA. So it was ultimately Vern Garnier or in his territory that the Hogan character was born in that sense. And then Vince just saw. Well, he just stole it. Then. Did. He just, he just, if you see something like that, you got to use it because he's, he was so different. Steamboat was too, except Steamboat needs more time. Savage, more the same. He just needs more time and a and a hot hot baby face to work with and a hot angle. And who was the last one you mentioned? Uh, Ric Flair was merely okay in the ring, and he was uh, quote unquote like killing Georgia business. But here's the mm -hmm. thing: I think they were running two separate cards on the same night, maybe or or maybe they're alternating the main event. And when Gene and Oli were on the main event the arenas would be a quarter or half full. When Ric Flair was in that arena, baby, that place was sold out. And I think, mm -hmm. as you alluded to before, professional jealousy. Uh, yes, because he didn't want that around. It's the only thing I can say. But Flair and Ole did not like each other, period. Why? They just didn't. 
because Flair is very, only is jealous of another talent that that was his spot being the top heel. That was his spot. And Flair comes in. He's also flamboyant and they've teamed up and done a few things. And probably the best thing, uh, that Ole did was induct Arn and in, in make him an Anderson. They inducted Arn to do the work because and and Arn looks like him anyway. So that was actually a good a good fit a good match. But you run into this all the time: professional jealousy, and some guy will not have if he's a booker, he don't want to have another guy to come in and get over to his degree because that gives the promoter or the owner, unless the booker is the owner, that gives the owner an option that he could just switch to this guy and not miss the booker any at all. So that's the only thing I can attribute that to. We'll get through a few more fan questions. Uh, I'm going to, uh, Aubrey, Aubrey too hotty. Actually, you've already addressed this, says RIP Oli. He was stabbed in my hometel, uh, hotel, hometown, Greenville, South Carolina in the 1970s by an audience member. You, you've already talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip Black Saturday stuff because I think we could do an entire episode or at least a prolonged uh, segment on that for a future episode so we'll keep that one uh, for a later day we've talked about uh, it will never be over and Dusty and Ole's relationship but here's another uh, fan question Mr. TLM question for Dutch uh, I'm sorry we've already talked about this with 1980 and the Georgia Championship Wrestling uh, babyface to heel thing again uh, show Ryu Ken says, did Dutch witness any interactions between Ole and Jim Hurd during WCW in the early 90s? And if so, what was the dynamic between the two men? And did Ole ever share his opinion of Hurd with Dutch at the time? I think Ole shared his opinion of Hurd to almost anybody who listened. Because <laughs> he thought Hurd was not a wrestling guy. He was a pizza guy who got put in a position that he didn't know what was going on. He didn't know promotion. He, kn he knew anchovies and olives, I guess. As he knew the pizza business. But he didn't know how to deal with wrestlers. He didn't know how to deal with personalities. He, needed to, he, he knew how to deal with a customer who wasn't happy with their anchovy pizza. He knew how to do that. But for a wrestler, here's, a, here's my Jim Hurd story. I had a job with them, and I forgot how I got the job. I think through through Ole, and then Ole left, and I didn't hear anything from him. So I called him up, and I kept calling her and calling her and calling her, and somebody said, "Well, you need to sue him." I said, "For what?" He said, "We're not bringing you in." I said, well, "That's my word against them." And they said, "Well, try it." So I went to this lawyer, this damn, just on the street lawyer. I paid him like 50 bucks. I said, this is the deal. And I said, listen, they offered to bring me in on this date. I give like 10th of June and the date coming. I didn't hear anything from them. Tell them that uh, unless they bring me in, I'm suing the company. It's a threat. I didn't know what to sue them about. And and I sent it certified mail, which makes it look official, I guess. Because when he gets certified mail, he has to sign for it, which means he got it. A couple of days later, after he got the letter, I, I got a call from his secretary. <laughs> and her and I, and I got to be friends with her later. I forgot her name. And she says, hi, Dutch. This is so-and-so. I'm Jim Hurd's, uh, you know, secretary. Okay. And Jim Hurd wanted me to call you and tell you that you you start. My dog's going to bark. All right. I thought Jim Hurd walked in. You were looking yeah, that at was, Yeah, that's Jim Hurd. Sorry, we can oh, barely yeah. hear him. You carry on. Okay. But anyway. She called me, hi, Dutch, this is so-and-so. I'm the secretary of Jim Hurd. And he wanted me to tell you that they want you to start. 
uh, some June 21st in Columbus, Georgia, or wherever it was. So I went to work down there. I had to, had to threaten to sue him, but I got a job and it worked for two years. So, but one of the good things out of getting hired down there is one day, Ole come up to me. He said, come here, you son of a bitch. <laughs> That's like saying, come here, my friend. I mean, you, you want a job? I said, well, what? Other than what you're doing now? Yeah. He said, I want you to commentate the show with Shabani. And do what? Commentate. You know what? <laughs> you know what that means? I went, well, yeah. He said, you start next week. Okay. So the next week I'm, I'm out there with Shabani and I stayed there the whole time. So me and Shivani out there commentating over the, I think, a worldwide show. I forgot. They had two. Yeah, there's, One syndicate. Yeah, there's, worldwide. it was worldwide. There was like Pro for a while. and WCW No, yeah, I think it was the worldwide show, I yeah. think. And it was me and Shivani for, for two years. And that's that's how I got to know really Tony. Tony's funny as hell, too. We need to have Tony on at one point. Um, I'll I'll try and put a call in for that. Uh, a few more fan questions. We'll close it down. Jason Bink, Dutch, how did... Oli changed from 1980 to 1990. I hear stories of how old school he was, so it's odd to me that he would even consider voicing the Shockmaster. Also, uh, did he do any booking in the 1990s? And if so, what do you think of his methods? So, uh, first question here is, how did Oli change from 1980 to 1990? I don't know what that question is. I don't know how to answer oh, oh, that. Per Personality-wise, when you met him in 1980 and then when you knew him in 1990, did he change in those 10 years? Not really. He was still, even when I, after he got hurt, whatever happened to Ole, you know, he's been having bad health. And, but I saw him probably in the mid, mid nineties. And we made this show somewhere in God knows where Georgia and it was a show and a, like a like a signing. And he was there. And they had about 150 people at this show, 200 maybe. And I told the guy what I do the show for, and he sent me half of it up front. But then at the end of the show, guess what? He didn't have enough money to pay everybody. And they were going to kill him. They actually drug him into the shower and said they're going to beat the crap out of him unless he comes up with the money. And I remember Arn was there, uh, some mask guy. Uh, the I Patriot, Del Wilkes. The you Patriot the was there, somebody else. And they had to call the police out. They took him down to the, to, to the station to, for protection. But I, I, but I wasn't with them because I'd got half my money. So I was halfway protected. So I just went home. I said, you do what you want to do. And they said, why are you leaving? I said, well, I got half my money. Well, why didn't we get half of ours? I said, I don't know. Maybe you didn't ask for it. I don't know why you didn't get it. I'm, I'm not in charge of that. But uh, I don't know if Ole was part of that. But he seemed the same. How did you describe him? Cant cantankerous, mm -hmm. irritable, malcontent. Something else. Can't Don't get along man, with anybody. Yeah. Disagreeable. He was the same way. He sat down there and he, he signed pictures. He wasn't on the show. He would just, it's, it's a signing where you come and they have pictures of themselves. You know, people have been to signing. They know what I'm talking about. And uh, he was the same way. He would argue with the people who would come up and buy his stuff. That was, that was only. And I went down there and said hello to him. And he kind of remembered me and then he kind of didn't. So that's, I would rather, and the reason I didn't talk to him more, it was because I wanted to remember him as he was and not how he is when I met him hmm. or not, not how he was when I, when I met him after 10, 12 years. Uh, I think we've got maybe two more. Um, very quickly, Stone Tank says, what are your thoughts of the short-lived Ole Anderson Tim Horner alliance after he got kicked out of the Horsemen? Such an odd pairing. No kidding. <laughs> Won't you team up Ole and damned uh, who's that piano player that was famous? Michael Beethoven. Who? Yeah, Beethoven. 
That, that'd be the same deal. Oh, you that's, mean the maestro? The, re- <laughs> the wrestling guy? Yeah, the maestro. Teaming them up, it didn't... I, I don't know. Uh, it, it was only. So anybody that saw it, you, you don't got it. I think he liked Tim a little bit. You ever meet Tim? Never spoke to him, no. Yeah, nice guy. He just... He just... Uh, East Tennessee is talks that way and everything. You ever heard him do an interview? I, I yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. He said, "Well, let me tell you, I'm gonna come there and to that town and yell. I'm gonna get in the ring and yell so and so whoever he's wrestling. And I'm gonna show you that you can't treat people that way. And it's in so and so town." <laughs> And I'm going to come there <laughs> and I'm going to get in the ring. And he says, he, he does the interview twice. So talking wasn't his, wasn't his strong point, but, and only teaming up with him. I never made, I never knew what to think of that. And it was an odd, odd pairing. Yes, it was. Uh, to finish this off, because we're going to go on to Smoky Mountain Wrestling with Tim Horner, who is probably most famous for Smoky Mountain and, and uh, among other things is, uh, Oli voiced the Black Scorpion, rumoured to be a pitch by Oli to Jim Hurd as a joke that went out of uh, control. And he also voiced the Shopmaster, as mentioned before. But then the story of how he got fired from WCW. Eric Bischoff fired Bryant Anderson, which was Oli's son. And yep. then Oli tried to get Bryant a job with Jim Cornette's Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And Bischoff mm-hmm. hated Cornette so badly at the time that uh, Bischoff fired Oli over it. So you with Smoky Mountain at the time, do you remember the, the brouhaha with this happening? I remember it, but did Bryant ever make it to Smoky Mountain? Uh, I'd have to check. I don't remember ever seeing a match with him. I don't think he made it either, to tell you the truth. But see, that goes back to prof- professional jealousy. This was all, and Heard was still there, right? No, this is, when, this is when Eric Bischoff had taken over in 93. Well, Bischoff. So he hated Cornette. Mm-hmm. And why did he hate Cornette so bad? I don't know, because Cornette had a relationship with Bill Watts, which saw Cornette go to WCW with a couple of um, cross-promotion things with the Heavenly Bodies and such, and then Bischoff took over. Bischoff in now, some hating, ways. Now, hating Cornette is not an, an unheard of experience. No. There's a lot of guys that don't like Jimmy because Jimmy, he just like a, if if he didn't like you, he would, he would have no, no qualms about telling you that you're just a no good piece of crap. And I think that's probably why him and Ole got along because their techniques were similar. So about, uh, uh, Bischoff firing Oli. Uh, I think Oli was at the end of the end of the the run anyway, mm-hmm. and I don't think Oli liked Bischoff being the one to tell him. That was what it was. To answer your question, Brian Anderson would do some matches in WCW up to ninety four, and then he would appear in Smoky Mountain Wrestling from. Uh, October 1994. So I suspect you'd left by this point, but he I, would actually, I was in, yeah, I was in Puerto Rico. Yeah, uh, you, uh, yeah, sorry, Bryant was there until the beginning of 1995. So to answer your question, yes, uh, Bryant was there for a brief period, and I got Bryant confused with Brad in my mind because Brad was in WCW. He was Gene's son, and he wrestled as the masked pink bedet Zan Panza. Uh, and I think you teamed with him or wrestled him at one point, even though I think I've asked you this, you didn't even remember. I don't remember. No, I, I really don't. Because you have so many matches, really against so many people in so many towns, because it all blurs together. Because somebody says, well, what does so-and-so town look like? I see it from a ring with a ring light over it and people out there. Maybe. Maybe yeah. some people out there. Maybe no people. Maybe some empty chairs. I, was, yeah. I have wrestled. I, I've been in some towns that the whole section 
would be empty. And I said, damn, Hooper. I think a marble chute would have would have drawn more people. They had to, they didn't, it tells me they didn't promote it at all. Just pro wrestling would draw you at least 100 people. Anyway, if you promote it halfway right, if you got a good card, you might draw five, six hundred, according to what you got to pay for. And that that's how much money you make. If you don't have a big payday, uh, a payroll, you, know, you make a little money. We are going to end it there. Thank you very much, Dutch, for taking us through Ollie Anderson and all the news, as we always do. This podcast is going from strength to strength, and we're getting so many questions in for the well for this for the story time thing we don't normally ask fan questions for it but especially for ask touch anything which is on every single tuesday where fan questions are asked and they are submitted via questions for dutch at gmail.com the plugs once again we've got books i've got one over my shoulder glued to the wall dutch has two you can get them on amazon you can get them signed through dirty dutch man tell with two l's at gmail.com and he also has the diplomas as well the shane douglas podcast i'll figure out when that's coming back but we just can't seem to get our times aligned at the moment to bring an episode out and is there anything how many else? have you done how many how many episodes have you done is it 20 something the low 20s or something like that with shane with shane yeah Really? I didn't know you did that many. Yeah. We I thought you was like under 10. No, no, no. Well, we keep doing fits and starts due to just, it's just tough. It's, it's tough with the times. So. But I'll put it on Twitter or wherever. You'll know when it's coming back, for goodness sake, when we can start recording again. Uh, were there any more plugs that I've forgotten? Um, so oh, yeah. Um, May the 10th. Oh, yeah. May the 11th. I'm going to be appearing live as opposed to appearing dead. I'm going to be appearing live in Evansville, Indiana, my old stomping grounds. And it's uh, going to have Jerry the King Lawler, which I think this is one of his first few appearances after his stroke. Uh, Bill Dundee will be there. Austin Idol. Hey, Dutch. He'll that be doesn't there. doesn't work for me, brother. <laughs> I think... Uh, Handsome Jimmy is there, and Tommy Rich. So it's actually it's a pretty good lineup if you want to go guys that are about to fall over. <laughs> but this <laughs> might be the last chance you get to see any of us. But that's May the 10th, May the 11th, at the National Guard Army. They wanted to use the Evansville Coliseum, but it's under, uh, and that would have been a great place to have it. But it was it's under repairs. So it's at the National Guard Army, and it's two shows, Friday and Saturday, and check your local, uh, or I guess your local promotion for when it starts and ends. There you go. And there was one more thing. Pro Wrestling Tees are on Pro Wrestling Tees, and I keep forgetting to plug that as well. But for now, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. We will catch you again on Tuesday for Ask Dutch Anything, a Dutch, we the people. We the people. <laughs>